Cool. Can everybody see my screen? We can see your screen. Yes. Yeah. How's everybody doing? I guess you can. Uh, can all reply at once. Yes, but uh, they, they can write in the chat so uh, they can they can show their opinion. Yeah. Good. All right. Cool. All right. There's a chat. Everyone says hello. Good. All right. Excellent. Cool. It's really early here. I was a a jazz musician in a past life and. Uh, now I'm a computer scientist, but neither of these are professions that uh, you know are usually compatible with waking up at uh, seven in the morning. So uh, it was an experiment, but we made it here. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. I guess I, I wish we could all be together uh, somewhere. Um, I guess in Moscow, but uh, it was uh, it's great to connect virtually. Um, and I guess. Uh, and so far as these summer schools really serve a purpose of uh, broadening education and um, uh, connecting people, um, then maybe maybe actually the move to virtual is like overall a, a good thing for uh, society here. Um, I'm going to talk in my sessions about uh, distribution shift. So I'll start off, introduce myself a little bit, and then kind of motivate the problem. Um, let's see, make sure. Cool. So my name is Zachary Lipton. Um, I'm a faculty at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I am a joint faculty, so I uh, work uh, over with a social scientist in the business school, um, where I'm faculty of operations research, and I'm also a faculty in the school's computer science, um, where my, my primary affiliation is with the machine learning department, and then I also associate with the school of public policy and uh, societal computing. So to give a sense of, um, the kinds of things we work on and the kinds of things we think are important and how this sort of ties into the motivation for this lecture is that overall we're concerned with actually using machine learning in the real world. So we're interested in um, um, things like healthcare. So healthcare, I, I just personally get more excited about uh, healthcare than about advertising. So that sort of was something that I anchored to early. I think now you have more options in machine learning. When I started machine learning, your options were either, uh, in 2013, it was either uh, uh, get a faculty job or work on ads. And these were the only options that were presented to you. It was either go to Google and work on ads, they hire machine learning people. Oh, there's a third option, which was, uh, you know, leave PhD and become uh, a software developer. And then you start your career seven years late and you never get promoted as far or make as much money. So now, PhD has, I guess, become a more attractive proposition um, in terms of maybe career paths. But, um, you know, I always anchored to these problems like healthcare just because I personally got excited about them. And when you start thinking about a problem like healthcare, uh, you become aware that there's like sort of a glaring disconnect um, between the kinds of problems that, um, you know, we're formulating abstractly, the kinds of uh, setups were sort of developed some machinery to address. And then the sort of actual nature of the decisions that we make in the real world, or the, I should say probably the, the nature of these sort of envisioned applications of ML. So in general, in machine learning, we have sort of one workhorse that works really well, which is supervised learning. Um, and when you start reaching into these other um, application areas, you start realizing that there's um, a lot of the things we're saying, like there, there, there are some things in the real world that look almost like true, proper supervised learning problems, even in healthcare. So an example would be something like, uh, um, like uh, doing pathology from microscope images, you know, where maybe you're trying to classify something as one of, uh, you know, recognize some number of diseases and you're looking at images from a microscope and you really don't believe that what images look like are gonna change over time. You even have some control over it, like you can standardize the equipment. You can create something that looks almost like a supervised learning problem. But we're not just talking about, um, when, when you see people talk, get excited about AI and what you could do with machine learning, we're not just talking about, um, you know, maybe uh, automating or partially automating uh, just uh, pathology reports from microscope images. Um, we start talking about making decisions and you start seeing people talk about making better treatment decisions, automating things. It's always about automating things, self-driving cars, um, for example. Um, you know, you, you see, like, your, your next doctor is going to be an AI. You know, you've come to see these sorts of claims and you think, well, what does it actually take to make those kinds of decisions? And you start becoming aware of a lot of disconnects between um, 
the, the sort of broad brush we painted of the kinds of applications we, where we think like AI is going to conquer and the kind of very narrow methodology that we have for addressing it. And sometimes this disconnect can become so glaring that it sort of just undermines the technology in a way where, you know, things can kind of go wrong catastrophically. So in the lab, we kind of like sit at this like intersection between like the, the abstractions we have in the machinery and the real world and try to figure out what's missing. Um, and then we use this to back up and, and then go back and do um, practical work, but also theoretical work. Um, so we work on healthcare, but this has also led us to look at questions of robustness. So that's what this talk is going to address. All these topics are actually more related than they might seem at first. Um, so robustness, we want models that are going to behave uh, well, not just when I evaluate them on a random partition of the original data set that I was given to train my model uh, that was selected for holdout. I want it to perform well in the actual test set, which is you know out, out in the real, real world making decisions um, in real time. Um, and you know, with all the all the various things that might change when I move from one environment to the other. The other thing is, I don't just want to make predictions. I want to make decisions, right? So I don't just want to uh, say, um, is someone, you know, how likely would someone have been to die, given that uh, they presented with these covariates and that uh, a doctor, uh, you know, gave them a particular treatment? I want to be able to say, how likely would someone be to die? Uh, if, if we're the, I would like to be able to assess, I'd also like to be able to assess how likely would someone be to die if they presented with the same set of covariates, but instead of giving the treatment that otherwise would have naturally occurred in the data set, the doctor gave a different treatment, right? So in order to make um, these kinds of decisions coherently, and I believe Susan Athey, uh, who's a great economist, who's um, uh, a world authority in, in estimating these kinds of quantities called treatment effects, um, you know, is it, part of the program. It, this becomes something that we care about too. And, and causal thinking, as you'll see, actually enters robustness too. Because when you start talking about robustness, you say, well, the world's going to change between the training period and the test period. And then um, once you start saying the world's going to change, uh, there's a question of, well, what stays the same? Uh, because if anything can change in any way, then uh, God could just switch the labels. You know, it's like you could just have a really arbitrary uh basically this is trivially shown to be you know you don't have to be uh like a uh, girdle to uh to prove that uh learning uh with no assumptions on how the future is related to the past is is not possible um so it's just fundamentally impossible so then you say well what kind of assumptions can we make about how the past relates to the future and oftentimes this relates to something that whether it's explicitly stated or not starts to sound like or explicitly become in like the most formal sense a causal story so you say something like well i believe between the past and the future uh the amount of coronavirus has changed however maybe i don't i believe there's a generative process by which someone gets coronavirus and then given that they have coronavirus they get symptoms and i think maybe the process by which someone gets symptoms given they have the virus doesn't change but the marginal over the virus can change so this starts to look like a causal problem, but instead of estimating a causal effect, we're concerned with um, a causal uh, story that relates the past to the future, where the difference is that one uh, is the result of someone having applied some kind of perturbation uh, to, the, to the distribution. So for say an intervention in causal language. Um, uh, it, it won't be the primary focus of these talks, although maybe one paper that I discussed will have some implications. Um, but we, we also, uh, a top priority for the lab is, is thinking about sort of the societal impacts of deployed machine learning technology. And again here, um, expressing these questions coherently uh, often has this flavor that is not so unrelated as it might seem at first, the questions about robustness and causality. Um, there are certain epistemic and moral questions. There's normative questions that you have, but there's also causal questions. Like when you say what, uh, when you talk about corrective justice, like I, I believe that, uh, uh, Rodrigo should have to uh, pay me to uh, uh, make up for some crime that he committed against me or something, uh, or, or, or somehow something that he did that uh, caused me uh, to lose property or whatever, I have to make an argument to the court that, um, you know, like basically that, that, that Rodrigo was the cause for me to, to be in a particular situation and therefore like restitution is... Um, is is warranted so so these questions are are often related and i think they're related more broadly to the theme of uh, of sort of what the kinds of problems we're attracted to which is where 
like the, the problems that fall in the cracks between kind of like a, a purely sort of engineering way of, uh, you know, uh, the language that we have and, and, and the actual kind of broader set of desiderata that, calcul that, that characterizes the problems we care about. Um, so, you know, we're, we're also interested in uh, economics increasingly. And, and one reason why we're interested in economics is that you think, well, what, what are the various ways that the distribution changes in the real world? And one of them that we'll talk about now is because I think we need to, we need to start with the simplest thing and, and build solid foundations. But we're talking about this lecture, um, you know, towards the end, we'll, our, our, our main kind of case that we'll go into um, is when the distribution changes sort of in a passive kind of way. It, it just changes. Uh, like you're an observer, you're, you're passive. Uh, it didn't depend upon like the decisions you made or the classifier. It's just that you encountered one world, now you encounter a slightly different one. Um, but often uh, in the real world, if you're deploying machine learning, even for many of the very common applications where it's actually deployed, this is not how things work. Um, it's not that the world just happens to change, it's that you actually are the cause of the change. So a great example of this is probably one of the longest running applications of machine learning is recommender systems. And in recommender systems, um, you're changing the set of exposures that a bunch of people uh, see when you change the recommendation engine. But once you change their exposures, uh, you start changing their behavior because you're actually, these people are learning, uh, they're trying to influence the algorithm, so they're trying to figure out how the algorithm works, and when you change how the algorithm works, they're going to change their behavior, and then, you know, the assumptions you made about the environment being kind of static or no longer uh, faithful. So, um, uh, when, once you start thinking about that, you say, I'm not just making a prediction, or imagine I'm giving someone a loan. If I'm giving someone a loan, uh, I make a prediction of uh, whether or not they're likely to repay the loan based on uh, what shoes they're wearing. And I decide, okay, everyone who wears Oxfords is going to repay the loan and everyone who wears sneakers is not. Um, this is going to work very well from a supervised learning standpoint, possibly, for all I know. Maybe sneakers uh, are a good feature, uh, you know, in addition to the other features that communicate something about, uh, you know, maybe the occupation of the person, which gives you some information. Um, but... The, the problem here is um, if people, if you start making decisions that way, immediately everyone else is going to go out and start changing their behavior. If you say, I'm going to give loans to everyone who uh, has Oxfords and none to anyone who wears sneakers, then people are going to stop wearing sneakers when they show up at the bank. Um, and then your model, which was accurate on the training data, is no longer useful. It has this discriminative feature that has evaporated. And the very reason is because you used it. Um, we also do a lot of work on natural language processing, and, and, and this actually kind of, um, you know, tying into sort of all these other themes. So um, the, the focus for the, the primary lectures here that I'm going to go through are one, um, I'm going to go through, uh, basically I'm going I'm, I'm to sort of go through an introduction to like kind of a, a broad set of these kinds of problems um, and kind of situate them within a common framework of thinking about learning in the context of distribution shift. And then we're going to go really deep on one problem that I've been working on for a long time, which is called uh, uh, label shift. So the problem is uh, the label distribution changes, but the class conditionals don't. And we have labeled source data and unlabeled target data. What can we do? And what I like about this problem is it's simple enough that we can go through, we, we make this one very strong assumption, but then we can work through the entire process of um, you know, how do we detect shift? How do we uh, correct for it? Um, or how do we detect that there was shift? How do we estimate precisely what's the new label distribution? How do we uh, incorporate this information to, to correct our models going forward? And then tomorrow, I'm going to start off um, with some more advanced uh, topics that are building upon that work. And we'll talk about um, a, a much deeper dive into detecting shift, a deeper dive into correcting for it. And also various other ways that have been proposed for trying to deal with distribution shift, maybe um, in more heuristic ways in the context of deep learning um, and ways uh, recently that we've worked on uh, incorporating human in the loop feedback. Um, see how are we doing on time? Not too bad. So um, if anyone wants to, uh, the papers that I guess will comprise like the, the uh, a good chunk of the line of original work that we'll be discussed here are, are these links. So if, if, you, if you're interested um, in this work, uh, you can just sort of screenshot this or I could share the slides later. Um, so um, we've already been talking about this sort of informally, but now we're going to get a little bit more formal or not that much more formal, but you know, slightly more formal. 
we'll, 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 we'll ease it in. Um, but you know, th this is sort of a cartoon of how machine learning uh, uh, sort of framing up problems proceeds, which is we say, uh, I live in the world where uh, God, uh, who, uh, you know, I guess was uh, best captured sometime in the Renaissance, uh, God uh, showers data out of the sky and uh, we just go and we collect some of it. And then we uh, basically make an assumption, which is that, um, you know, we can use this data to train our model and that uh, we could just basically assume that the, that the transition function, you know, the update function for uh, God's behavior is going to be the identity function. God is completely constant in time, is uh, not changing anything. Um, and so we, we collect our data and basically it's enough for us to just collect data today and just randomly partition it because there's no difference between a random partition, you know, the left side and the right side. There's no difference between that and past and future because we've already assumed away anything that could change between the past and the future. And therefore, we can take a partition of our data that we collected for training and we could call it like the, the, the you know, we could just treat it as like the deployment environment. This is the, 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 the basic assumption that we always make. And so um, because you've assumed away any possible change in the world, um, you know, the, the only sense in which we then challenge ourselves to generalize is to generalize from finite samples to uh, general populations. However, we don't assume that anything can change in the distribution of the population. So um, we sort of ignore these problems of generalization of how do we generalize in a world uh, that is not faithful of assumption where, where, where God can wake up tomorrow and uh, have a change of mood and say, you know, uh, today, um, you know, God discovered Instagram today and now photographs are going to look different because um, she or he is using uh, a new filter or something. So you get the idea. Um, so we sort of need to figure out how to, to, to deal with these kinds of problems. And what I'm trying to convince you is that these problems are not, um, you know, sometimes you see a problem in a uh, paper and you say, you know, they say, oh, we took this, you know, problem and then we added this constraint and then we added that constraint and then we made this assumption about whatever. Um, and then we tried to solve it. And, and then you say, is, is, is this really a problem that exists in the world? I'm going to try to convince you that distribution shift is actually not um, a contrivance, but it's sort of the opposite. It's a problem we've all been ignoring, um, but that actually sort of plagues basically almost all, or I'd say it's the norm. Uh, uh, I say it's, it, it's the rule, not the exception. So uh, one example that people uh, have focused on is the susceptibility of models to adversarial examples. Um, and we'll, we'll cover this um, a bit, but not, not in as much depth. Let's give a little bit of a teaser here. You know, um, so, so everyone already knows this, I think, at this point. So well, no, I won't go too deep into it. But, you know, there, there's this example from 2014 that started worrying people um, that uh, you, uh, you, you can take a, a photo, you, you can take a, a component that's been trained to get very high accuracy on the ImageNet data set. And then you could take the inputs and you could add a very small amount of noise. Um, and you can do this for almost any image in the data set, almost any image in the test set, you could find some noise perturbation where you add that to the original image. The result, um, and this is what scared people, is that it could be small enough that to a human, it doesn't even look like a different image. So that we wouldn't even just say that this is a similar image. Anyone would look at it and say, yes, that is the same photograph. Um, you know, they probably wouldn't even be able to differentiate left and right sometimes. And still, uh, you can induce a machine learning model to misclassify um, these images. And so on one hand, um, it's sort of like, uh, why should we be surprised? Like all we ever did, the only contract we ever signed was that if data comes exactly from this distribution, we, like this is what it is when you calculate accuracy. When you can't calculate accuracy, what you're evaluating is the mean of a distribution, right? Like what is the mean, I mean, calculate your error rate, what is the mean of you know, the indicator function of whether or not you have an error? Um, and, and you're interested in what is it on like the uh, distribution that generated your data, when you evaluate this on, on finite samples, um, you're just getting a uh, approximation of that quantity. That's always said. We never, we never made any kind of statement 
Um, and the reason why you feel good about accuracy is like, because you know, that, that actually converges really quickly. And like, it, it really is, the reason why you feel good, sorry, about test set performance is it really does give you um, uh, a really good approximate of, of that quantity. However, that quantity is only assuming that the distribution is exactly the same distribution. We never had any kind of assurance. Um, we never had any reason to believe in the first place that uh, if we somehow uh, go even a tiny bit outside the support of the distribution, um, that there isn't in the neighborhood of, any, of every correctly classified image, also some slightly different, slightly unusual image that we were, would be very unlikely to encounter in um, uh, training that, that fools the model. So, you know, I think part of what's going on and part of people being naive here is that um, when you do really good at anything, uh, you get a little drunk with power, like you, you think. So I think, you know, we do really good at classification under the ID assumption. We start saying things like human level, you know, to describe how we're doing. And then we start feeling like what we have done is human level in some more uh, substantial sense, and it's not. And so then we're really shocked when we find out that we only did really good at the thing that we optimized for. And the things that we didn't even know how to frame as problems, uh, we didn't do good at. So in some sense, this isn't a peculiarity of neural networks. That's maybe a big part of the argument that I'm making today. Um, you know, like the, the takeaway here was people, there was a lot of hype about deep learning. A lot of people said, oh, see, you think deep learning is good, but deep learning is uh, nonsense. Look, it, it's easily fooled. Um, and a lot of people were kind of like happy about this who, you know, had maybe previously been unhappy that like uh, with the success of deep learning. But the truth is, this isn't about deep learning. This is about supervised learning. And that's kind of a really important point that I want to get across. Um, so just like a little bit of a follow up here, as it turns out, these vulnerabilities are, are not limited to cases where you have, uh, um, you know, could directly intervene on pixels and have white box access to models. Um, it's also true that you could uh, come up with um, certain sorts of patterns such that you could actually um, place them on real world objects in the physical world and induce misclassification. Um, so this obviously uh, worried people that some pranksters might uh, deface stop signs or something, and then suddenly all the self-driving cars might start crashing. Um, so you know, there, there's sort of a long literature here, and we'll go too deep into it. Where basically, there's you know, there's targeted and untargeted attacks. One is where you attack the model. Um, so these are basically anticipating. You could think of you know, overall the problem is still a bit artificial, but what it sort of reveals to you is that you know. Uh, in general, you're not always in maybe these explicitly adversarial uh, settings where people are literally able to intervene on pixels. Although you could be, for example, if somebody was uh, trying to fool an ID system. Um, but you also, uh, it should make you think more generally about not just the explicit adversarial setting, but sort of any time you have an actor who uh, uh, has some kind of motives that are you know, not necessarily aligned with yours. I think the bank example is a good one here where you, know, you have strategic behavior. You're making decisions based on covariates, but you have the applicants on the other side. So if you're thinking about why is, mach is machine learning, so lots of people are trying to commercialize machine learning for resume screening. And one of the reasons why this is a really irresponsible idea, among many and other sort of ethical concerns, one of the reasons why it's a bad idea is because the whole point of a hiring policy is, is to sort of set a coherent set of incentives, right? If you start saying, if, if you find that, um, you know, the most predictive uh, feature for whether or not someone's going to be a good employee is whether they watch a particular movie. If you start making decisions that way, suddenly uh, people are going to say, oh, all I have to do to get a good job is I have to watch this movie and say at the interview that I watched this movie. Um, and suddenly it becomes no longer a good feature. Um, so the, the general premise of, of adversarial taxes, you're assuming that the underlying distribution is fixed. The, the data is still coming from whatever, but that there's someone sort of in the middle who gets to monkey with the data. And they're constrained to take a monkey with it. Get, again, you know, if you make no assumptions, you can't do anything. They can't change data in any way. But you know, they're limited to some kind of threat model, some class of perturbations. And you want to produce a model that, in general, for any you know, given example, is you know, un the adversary would be, would be un unlikely to, to fool you. Um, and the um, kind of standard sort of um, uh, way to deal with it, I mean, the most effective one in practice, is basically to just try to attack the model during training and only train on these uh, attack images. And just the strength of the attacker during training turns out to make a big difference. And that was the difference between the original adversarial example performance and that um, uh, 
uh, from, from, from PGD, from, from Maju's group uh, a few years later. Um, there's also some weird connections between, uh, you know, ad adversarial examples seem to have some kind of broader uh, implications. Um, so this is some work that uh, a phenomenon that was identified by Alex Madri and that we followed up and identified in a, in a workshop paper at NERVS last year with a, an undergraduate student working with me that, interestingly, when you attack uh, these images to target them to look like another class, so for example, if you take this original uh, photo of a kitten and you say you want to make it look like a custard apple, um, if you do a targeted attack, so you just basically take the gradient with respect to the pixels and move them in the direction that moves a classifier's output towards uh, custard apple. Um, for uh, a vanilla just trained uh, convolutional neural network, it'll make the kitten look like just a noisy kitten. Or it'll make, uh, in the other one, there, make a, the computer look like a noisy computer instead of making it look like a banana. Um, uh, a really weird phenomena is that if you take an adversarially robust model, one that was trained with PGD, or one that was trained with uh, alternative approach that gives uh, a sort of nice, um, theoretical guarantees called uh, randomized smoothing. With either approach, uh, if you attack the image, you actually, uh, it seems, actually make it um, perceptibly look like the class, like the target intended target class. So you see over here, um, the kitten, as you attack it with either the smooth or the trained model, it actually does make it look like a custard apple. And uh, the smooth model, it even puts a face over here that's about to eat the apple. Um, uh, same here, this kitten turns into a sleeping bag. That one's kind of weird. Um, this one, it even puts a, a little man inside the sleeping bag. Um, so there seem to be some, some broader implications here, but I don't want to get too far off the path of what we really care about here, which is the vulner vulnerability of our models to sort of unanticipated um, shifts in the distribution. Um, so a lot of the adversarial examples just sort of maybe by legacy or maybe because it's sort of I think in general, maybe the dominant kind of modality in the machine learning community, and then also the one that maybe the phenomenon was originally demonstrated on. A lot of that data, uh, a lot of that uh, scholarship focuses on computer vision. Um, but this kind of vulnerability is not just limited to computer vision. And as an example, in a paper at ACL last year, uh, my student, um, uh, Danish, uh, together with Bolan and I, uh, showed that basically models are susceptible um, so state-of-the-art uh, text classifiers like BERT models are extremely susceptible to uh, so this issue with text, which is what is an imperceptible change in text? And like one, one version of an imperceptible change would be that you're only allowed to move a single character in the text. Like it's not imperceptible, like someone could see if you changed a, a B to a P or something. However, it's a minor enough change that it's sort of impossible to imagine uh, uh, a long document with a sort of overarching general applicable label where a single character is enough to actually flip, you know, what is the true label? What is the applicable label? Like if someone wrote a terrible review of a movie, you know, you can't find a single character where if you just delete that one character, just change it to one other character, um, you'll suddenly make the review positive. So it turned out that against the state-of-the-art uh, fine-tuned BERT model, um, just a single character attack is enough to uh, bring a, a performance below the level of random uh, guessing. Um, so, so, and you don't want to imagine what, uh, you, what damage you could do with two uh, character attacks. So, um, you know, it's just sort of a, a general problem that these models are, are weak against. Um, you know, the, the kinds of invariance that we think should hold in the uh, natural world. Um, there's other reasons why we might be concerned about distribution shift. Um, and I just want to kind of like broaden your mindset here is um, one reason why we'd be uh, extremely concerned about distribution shift is that um, very often what we train on is altogether uh, artificial. And we're just hoping that it's representative in some way of uh, the, deploy the environment where we want to deploy the model. And this comes up in many ways. Um, one example would be physics, right? Uh, where uh, in, in a lot of the um, particle exper experiments, they've sort of simulated down to the level of like subatomic particles and um, um, the, the very sensor equipment itself. They've simulated, um, you know, what exactly should, uh, say, like the Higgs look like, or what exactly should, uh, you know, if you've, you know, discovered evidence of supersymmetry, what should that look like, created a bunch of synthetic data, trained a model on the synthetic data, 
deploy in the real world and just hope that the real world is, gonna, is going to look like the synthetic data, such that the classifier trained on the synthetic data can recognize this evidence of this phenomena if you apply it in the real world. Um, now, you know, you, it's not that hard to imagine how that could go wrong. Like, basically, all they have to do is get any detail of the simulation wrong. Um, in another uh, paper, uh, my student, Divyan Kaushik, who uh, um, actually got a, a Best Short Paper Award for this work at EMNLP, um, we wrote a paper that I, I feel like we shouldn't have been able to write, but we were able to write because of um, uh, maybe a kind of like naivete about how people were creating data sets in general, which is uh, what we did is we looked at what the NLP community has been calling reading comprehension. And reading comprehension um, you know, uh, is uh, a sort of fancy and perhaps anthropomorphic way of saying um, not, um, you know, but basically what it really is, is question answering. It's just uh, passage-based question answering. So this is differentiated from like factoid type question answering or knowledge-based question answering, where someone just asks a question and you give the answer um, and you maybe have to hit the question against some large external knowledge base. Um, uh, instead, in, in, in QA, uh, sorry, in reading comprehension, what they do typically is you have a passage. So you have something like this passage down below. Uh, there's a bunch of spans within the passage. Um, and basically, any like contiguous span of text is a, is a candidate answer. Um, and then you have a question. And so the idea is the model should look at the question, and it should look at the answer, and it should now uh, generate output. And the output is usually... Um, a subspan of uh, of the of the article. Although there's a few, there's several different ways of formulating these. Just purely generative QA models, um, which sort of just generate by a decoding, you know, one word or one token at a time. Um, there, there's okay. So there's word piece models. Uh, I mean, uh, decoding type approaches. There's classification type approaches where maybe you just have a a set of a hundred controlled vocabulary, hundred possible answers, and it's just classification. And you have this kind of span based selection. I think are the most common ways of um, setting up these problems. So, so one problem, it turns out, is that, you know, these data sets are often created in an artificial manner. So one thing that people do is they'll do something like they'll take an article from CNN, they'll grab a bullet point associated with the article in like the, the, the teaser or something or the highlights, they'll grab the bullet point, they'll take that, they'll call it, they'll, oh, and then within the bullet point, they'll find uh, an entity using like an off-the-shelf named entity recognition system. So they'll pull out the entity and they'll call that the answer. They'll call the, uh, the, the entity list sentence, they'll call that the question, and they'll call the underlying uh, article the passage. So the problem that can happen here, basically, is you create a data set in this way, um, and you could even tell yourself stories about how the model is you know, attending to the question and the passage, and then it's using you know, a thousand-headed attention, and it's, uh, it's a discriminator, and does blah, 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 and it does all these things, and it's doing multi-hop reasoning, and it's connecting all the dots. Um, but at the end of the day, if you took, uh, at the time, what were the state-of-the-art models, uh, you could often find that if you just deleted the question or replaced the question with random words, or just randomly shuffled them, so the question somehow has no information at all about the answer, some of the models perform just as well. And so it's not clear that we've designed a task that actually is... Uh, reflective of question answering or even that requires uh, um, you know uh, reading comprehension in any sense in order to complete it and so this disconnect between the the the, the problem we've cast um, and, and and the real world scenario right it doesn't just come about when the world changes sometimes it's even more extreme it comes about because our problem you know our training data was never from the real world in the first place I think you could find a lot of problems that um, have this sort of phenomena in, in subtler ways where somehow or another uh, the data set is not natural. You know? So the data, you know, keep in mind, the underlying data here is real. It's CNN articles. Well, it's not natural is exactly the way it's put together as a machine learning task. Um, so I think you could find you know, a number of, of sort of similar uh, scary problems in the real world. Um, and again, uh, one thing that we've talked about already a lot is feedback loops, right? And this is the problem that the very deployment of a machine learning model can invalidate that very same model. So for example, um, with a recommender system uh, trained on human behavior, um, you're training it on like these traces of human behavior, but you're applying it for the very purpose of altering behavior. Uh, 
you know, you're applying it as part of like a system of uh, behavior modifications. Ultimately, uh, it might sound like cynical or conspiratorial. That sort of is what you are doing uh, when you're one of these large platforms and you're uh, changing these sorts of primitive, changing how people, what they see in what order, whatever you're trying to get people, you're trying to influence people uh, to take actions, to click on things. Um, you know, to what, when, when we should be having that influence and, you know, when, um, you know, we should sort of, uh, be wary of applying the technology is I think an, an ethical concern and a discussion that we should have. Um, but there's no denying that when you are applying the technology, that is what you are doing. And of course, um, it creates these kinds of feedback loops, right? Because people will behave differently when people will click on different things when they've heard of different things. They'll click on different things. Uh, their likelihood that they'll click on something might be very, very widely, depending upon how many times have you shown them the same item. So um, if you don't model uh, this, 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 this sort of interaction between the system and then the behaviors and then how that, you know, in turn informs the system that you train afterwards, it's very easy to wind up in systems where you have feedback loops, where the model thinks you're going to like something, so it shows it to you more but you're not tracking the, the role that the exposure is playing. You're just tracking clicks. So you see, oh, this person's clicking on this more. So then you think, I like it, e they must really like it. And I say, I'm gonna recommend it even more. And then, you know, a higher fraction of their clicks are on that kind of item. And then you can have these sort of confirmatory uh, uh, feedback loops where um, they're just clicking on the things you give them, but because you're not modeling the fact that, uh, you're not modeling the set of exposures, you can become blind to this. So you might ask, like, in general, um, you know, why don't we just uh, make a robust classifier that doesn't break on their distribution shift, the end? You know, let's come up with the robust algorithm, and then we're good. Um, and the, the problem, unfortunately, is that this, this doesn't actually, it's not a well-posed question. And, and I think, in general, um, this is a, maybe a big divide between, say, uh, maybe the biggest divide, I'd say, between um, like the causal inference community and the machine learning community is that in general, in the machine learning community, we set uh, objectives, we set empirical benchmarks, at least, you know, in the practical ML world, we often see these empirical benchmarks, like we want to hit a certain number and now we can just measure that. And then people start deploying stuff. And so we never have to ask a question about whether or not the question makes sense in the first place. If we're given the problems, they're expressed in a way where like all the thinking's already been done for you and you don't have to think yourself. Um, but the problem here is that um, what a, a lot of these, like when you step outside supervised learning, you often encounter these problems of what we call identifiability. So there's a question of, you know, in, in this case, under distribution shift, um, there's multiple reasonable assumptions that any one of them, you know, there are real world problems that are either follow that assumption or are close to following that assumption. But each of these assumptions is going to point you to a different methodology and you're going to get out a different answer. And the data, this is the key, crucial thing, the data by itself is unable to tell you which assumption is right. So when I say the data, I mean observational data. Maybe if you go out and do experiments, you can find out. Um, that's how we ultimately uh, learn this. We get the prior knowledge in the first place. But you could have a situation where there's two common assumptions. If you make one, you'll make a certain prediction. If you make the other, you'll make a different prediction. Um, and you can't just, the data doesn't tell you which is the right assumption. So we can't just uh, sort of just say, let's just make, you know, the right classifier that performs well all the time. Um, even, you know, basically we, 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 we need to uh, impose some kind of structure on the problem. And then this is going to make learning possible. So um, no classifier works well in all distributions in the first place. Um, and even no domain adaptation approach works well on all structural assumptions on how domains could be related. So when you see people just saying in papers, um, we deal with a problem of robustness under, you know, in domain adaptation, um, like period, uh, you know, we, we pose this thing, there's a GAN, there's a, a MAN, there's a, you know, there's a regularizer, there's a whatever, and then it works. It, it's instantly a lie. You know, not a lie, but you know what I'm saying? It's instantly uh, an incomplete account of what's going on there. Um, you have to make some kind of structural assumption. And if you think that you haven't made a structural assumption, uh, you're wrong. You actually made an assumption uh, or there's one implied by your algorithm. You just don't know uh, what it is. You just, you just weren't aware enough to think about it. So 
we can guarantee performance under uh, distribution shift when we have strong assumptions. Typical assumptions include um, things like bounding the divergence between the source and target distribution, um, or assuming um, shared support um, and uh, invariant conditionals, like maybe P of Y given X doesn't change over time. That's the covariate shift assumption. Or P of X given Y doesn't change over time. That's the label shift assumption. So, um, right, the problem is, yeah? We have two minutes left. 10 minutes left? Two minutes left. Oh, two minutes is, okay, wow. So we're just gonna, we're gonna have a, we're gonna push it all to tomorrow. Okay, yes. all right, great. So, um, I'll give you just kind of the, the, the beginning of the setup and then we will uh, resume tomorrow. It's going to be much more technical and we'll get through uh, algorithms and uh, follow-ups. So again, uh, no class R works well on all distributions, et cetera. Um, and the modern deep domain adaptation approaches sort of seem to offer something really intriguing, but it's sort of uh, working via unstated implicit or murky assumptions. We'll talk about that a bit tomorrow. Um, so um, actually, you know, well, maybe we'll end here. So, so um, I, you know, I'll, I have time for the motivation. So, um, so, so the, the, the first work, and we'll actually go through the algorithm tomorrow, but this is just sort of the, the, the motivation is, is dealing with specifically label shift. So um, uh, label shift uh, is, is a setting in which um, your, uh, actually, let me give the motivation here. Um, Here's why I care about label shift. So imagine that in August, you train an ammonia predictor. And uh, at the time, the prevalence, and I, maybe I should change this to coronavirus, and uh, it's, uh, I've had this slide for a, lot, you know, a little while, but um, uh, I was actually giving this talk in January, like when the, when the pandemic started, so it seemed, you know, uh, maybe we'll actually have a chance to, to, to actually use this kind of thinking in, in effectively in the real world. Um, Imagine that you train a pneumonia predictor and the prevalence is really low and you run it on the training data and the models, well, the models can fit the training data perfectly if you're doing deep learning. You could also post hoc calibrate it on the validation data. And if your model's, you know, approximately calibrated, it's also then going to say that like 0.5% of holdout data is positive. And if you run it in the wild, you know, imagine that you go out today and you run it in the wild and you say that, you know, 0.05% of the population is positive. Um, so you say, okay, the classifier seems to be working. Everything's checking out. So then a few months go by, and in January, there's an epidemic, and suddenly your classifier is saying not that 0.05% of people have pneumonia, but that 5% of people have pneumonia. So it's gone up 100x. Now, the question is, when you see this, um, you know, uh, you know what, what, what should you believe? How many people really have pneumonia? So um, I'm going to do a quick poll to uh, maybe gauge where people are, um, and then... Um, we can, we can end shortly after, but um, how many people think that if you train your classifier um, and uh, you know, in a population with 0.05% positive for pneumonia and you deploy it in the wild and your model's predicting 5% positive, do you think, um, how many people think that the real number of people who have pneumonia is more than 5%? Or maybe I should do a poll, and the answers are, I don't know, how to, I don't know, uh, maybe, maybe it's asking too much for like a 30 second poll. Am I gonna? Huh. All right, I can't do it. Do, do they have like voting? We are, we are writing the answers in the chat window. And uh, yes. Yeah, so okay, right. Most of them are going for plus. So more people have pneumonia. All right. So some people think less people have pneumonia. Some people think four. Um, something it depends on how well calibrated the model is. Cool. So um, the truth is, it's a trick question. Um, I haven't given you enough information to say what's happened. Um, uh, however, um, the intuition that more people have pneumonia, more than 5% of people have pneumonia um, is the right intuition, but it requires an assumption that we haven't stated. Um, so we have to make an assumption in order to be able to conclude how many people have pneumonia. Um, um, right. 
And the, the, the assumption that we're going to make is that ultimately our covariates, say in, in our example was like the, the, the appearance of the chest X-ray, the assumption that we're going to make is that our covariates are caused by the disease. So, you know, the, you know, the disease causes the manifestations, not that the manifestation causes the disease. And we make this assumption, and then what we say is what, what's allowed to change over time is um, the, the marginal of the disease. You know, what is the incidence of the disease? That could change. But we don't believe what the disease looks like changes. And if we make that assumption, then indeed we can conclude that more than 5% of people have pneumonia. And to just, you know, look at it intuitively and say, why, why is that the case? Um, the reason why is uh, clearly the case um, is that, well, your model was trained under a prior that said pneumonia is very rare. And so when it saw the data today, it thought that there were 5% of people had pneumonia, even though it, it thinks that pneumonia is much rarer than it really is. Right? So imagine that there actually were 5% of people with pneumonia. Your model is trained to think that 0.05% of people had pneumonia. And so your model overall is going to be underestimating because the prior is too low. So in the example that your model makes deterministic predictions and is always perfect, it's possible that exactly 5% of people have pneumonia. But if your model's not perfect, and again, assume that your model's even like the Bayes optimal classifier under the source distribution, then your model is going to be actually under, in general, underestimating. Um, you know, in the event that the incidence goes up, your model's going to underestimate. In the event that the incidence goes down, your model's going to overestimate. Um, and so, you know, this should be immediately concerning because people do this all the time. You train a model and then you deploy it in a changing world for the purpose of uh, quantification, right? Like all these people who are doing real-time uh, analytics on social media, see so like track uh, an entity and see what fraction of the tweets are positive versus negative. They're all doing this based on, um, you know, you're all doing it um, uh, like sort of like ignoring away the fact that the classifier is no longer valid once the distribution changes. And so the question is like, you know, if you trained it in a world that's 50% positive, 50% negative opinion, if it's 0% positive in the wild, do you think your model is going to predict 0% positive? No, your model is probably still going to predict what, 5%, 6%, something like that. I don't know. Um, and so, so we really need to think about this when we deploy models for this, um, these tasks that, you know, have this flavor of like quantification tasks. You know, this is not a valid image. It's going to give you some proportion. And it's, you know, some people like to imagine that if they feed through pictures of cats and dogs to a classifier trained on uh, positive and negative x-rays, that they're going to get out some, some number like 50% that communicates ambivalence. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, it's often the case. For example, if you feed, um, and we actually did this experiment, if you train classifiers on, say, cats and dogs from the CIFAR data set, and then you feed through pictures of horses or pictures of trucks or pictures of airplanes, uh, for some reason, uh, and this is, you know, I could only say that this is true on a particular training run of ResNets, whatever, but in general, uh, in our experience, they're all classified as cats. And why? Well, who knows? It, it's hard to have intuition about, you know, what happens, but basically, we had no right to expect anything. We never told the classifier during training. It was no part of our objective how it should perform on, 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 on these other images. So I think, like, you know, what, what, what did... Uh, you know, something changed between source and target, but what stayed the same? Here's a second motivation for why we should care about shifting uh, class distributions is, uh, you know, look at what we normally do in image classification. I talked before about the problem of constructing synthetic data sets that don't necessarily match any real world problem. Um, you know, imagine that you train a classifier, uh, like what's the normal machine learning thing to do? You grab a bunch of uh, images from each of the classes that you want to detect, and usually construct a data set with a uniform label distribution. So imagine that you train a classifier to distinguish between, say, cats and dogs, and uh, you did this and you got 70% um, accuracy, and let's say it's balanced error, so your confusion matrix looks like uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, something like that. Um, so that's, you know, okay, you get a number, basically, the point is that it's some number greater than 50%, so this means your classifier is doing better than the blind classifier. It's doing something. If you see that it's got 70% accuracy, you know, this isn't, um, you know, alarm bells don't necessarily go off that something's wrong. However, if you deploy this in the wild and say, imagine in the wild that there is actually 90% dogs and only 10% cats. In that case, your classifier is still getting 70% accuracy, but you're actually in a world where if only you just knew the exact fraction of um, 
the, the lily bowl distribution, if you, if you just knew that there were 90% dogs, you could get 90% accuracy just by predicting all dogs. So suddenly the fact that you're getting 70% accuracy is, is not all that reassuring. Um, so what's happened is the problem's gotten easier. And in general, real world problems, you know, real world, large scale, multi-class problems, almost never are actually class balanced across all the categories. And so in these kinds of cases, if what you, if what you actually cared about was accuracy, and it's not necessarily the case, you might have some kind of cost sensitivity. So you might want to, you know, care more about certain kinds of errors, like care more about false and false negatives. But regardless, you know, you're going to be performing, if you just naively apply your classifier from training uh, on a uniform distribution, on a different distribution of labels, um, you're going to get um, performance that, that is sort of not as good in general as you could have gotten, you know, if you actually uh, knew the class distribution. So, um, you know, think about ImageNet. You train on a data set that has equal amounts of ice cream, couches, motorcycles, mortar boards, golden retrievers, axolotls, dogs, you know, actually, no, there's many more dogs because each breed of dog gets its own category, but you get the idea. Um, um, you know, there's no actual real world situation that you're gonna go into where you're gonna have equal numbers of all these categories of images. And so one thing that you could exploit is that you don't just have to make a prediction on a single image. You can look at all the images that are streaming through at test time. You can look at say, you know, a window of time and say, hey, um, you know, it basically, if you, if, you could, if you could decipher from that unlabeled data what was the actual class distribution, then you could update your classifier on the fly to make more accurate predictions. Um, indeed, this is a thing that all of us do all the time. So I think this is a theme to anything that kind of involves sort of causal intuitions, and you'll sort of see how this does too, um, that very often we, uh, the problems maybe seem um, more exotic technically, but actually speak to a kind of reasoning that we engage in every single day. Um, and indeed there's a paper, um, it's a cognitive science paper from ICML 2010. Um, I was really surprised that this was an ICML paper, um, but uh, maybe they were more open-minded in 2010. Um, there's a really cool paper called the test item effect, or cognitive models of the test item effect in human category learning. And basically what they do is they train humans to do a prediction task. And it's not a trivial prediction task. And so you give them a couple categories of images, you know, call them whatever you want. Uh, I, I like in lectures to call them weebles and squeebles because I don't remember what the real uh, uh, categories are. Um, you train the people to do it. You show them identical training items, but then you randomize people when they're gonna be evaluated. And some people, you give them a test set that contains mostly weebles. And the other people, you give them a test set that contains mostly squeebles. And the point is that you've shown them identical training items, but you can manipulate how someone is going to classify a test image based on basically uh, what other test items you present alongside it. And the idea is that if you present someone a data set that has mostly one category, then people sort of go through a process in their head where they say, wait a minute, I'm not perfect at differentiating between these two categories, but this whole set, this whole test set, looks a lot more like category one than category two. So now I'm gonna update my thought of, you know, actually I think category one's more common. So this is actually, um, it's a lot like what students do when you have a multiple choice exam, if you remember in uh, like elementary school, um, or I don't know, maybe they're using multiple choice exams, you know, much later in life, but you get the idea um, of, you know, when you go through a multiple choice exam and you see, uh, the answer, uh, let's just say one of the categories, like uh, the choice, there's A, B, C, and D or something, but the choice C seems to be, you go through your first pass and you notice that the answer to like half the questions uh, was C, where it would only be a quarter if, uh, if they were really uniform distributed. It seems that there's a, a lopsided distribution of the choices. And then suddenly you start thinking, wait a minute, maybe I should go back and to the questions where I was unsure and change the answer to C because you know, maybe, maybe C is actually more common. And so you know, I think a, a, a teacher might uh, scold you for this as like a lack of confidence in the right answer, but in a way you're engaging in coherent uh, probabilistic reasoning that you're saying, um, wait a minute, I started off with a prior that the classes were uniform. Based on that, I updated my beliefs. Now I realize that uh, the class distribution has changed. I'm gonna go back and revise my beliefs to say that you know, the more common class may be actually, uh, the, the class that I now think is more common, I should go back and update my predictions. I actually think it's, you know, uh, 
the priors, um, you know, higher. So I think the, the posterior should be as well. Um, so here's a formal setup to domain adaptation. Uh, we have um, um, two distributions, um, but everyone can hear me. Uh, all right. Cool. Yes. All right. Here. Excellent. It's like uh, I'm really paranoid because I gave a talk at Twitter a couple of weeks ago and my internet went out in the middle of the talk and uh, it took me like 15 minutes to realize that I was talking to myself. So, um, <laughs> no, cool. all right. Sound and video, everything's fine. All right. Everything's good. So the formal setup for domain adaptation is we have a source distribution, which we're going to call P and a target distribution, which we're going to call Q. And from the source distribution, we get to see labeled data. But from the target distribution, we only get to see unlabeled data. And that's why when we say this, we get samples X and Y drawn from P, but only X drawn from Q. And the goal is to predict well in the test distribution, but you want to do this. Um, so the naive thing, when we say well, what does well mean, right? So, so what's buried in this is uh, the default thing that we could always do is just train on the training data and predict on the test data and ignore any possible distribution shift. So when we say we want to predict well on the test data, what we're really saying is we want to do, in general, we want to try to do better than if we did that naive thing. If we just train a classifier and then just apply it, we want to do better by virtue of having this unlabeled test data available. And the challenge is that we don't actually get to see any labels from the test data. So right, our goal, you know, uh, sort of unpack a little bit more is we could say that, you know, okay, um, Uh, is going to shift. Um, sort of our example before the pneumonia predictor sort of shows like if we just see that the, the distribution of outputs of our classifier shifts, we already knew the, know the underlying distribution uh, has shifted because the distribution of outputs is just the push forward of, um, of the, the, the P of X, right? Or, or of the, of the, is that just the push forward of, of the, uh, the marginal over X through our classifier. So basically if our classifier outputs have changed, the marginal over X has changed. Um, so in general, you know, we, we know that the distribution has changed. And you know, when that's happened, we want to first, one, be able to detect efficiently in a sample efficient way detect that that's happened. We want to estimate the new label distribution. And we want to correct our classifier on the fly. And remember, we want to do this without uh, getting to see any labels on the target data. So the assumption that applies here that makes sense is the label shift assumption. Um, and uh, we'll compare it to the covariate shift assumption, but this is not the covariate shift assumption. So a lot of people use the word covariate shift just to say distribution shift. But that's not actually what it means. They're, 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 it's a, they're, these are more specific structural assumptions about um, not really about what changes, but about what stays the same. So in label shift, the idea is that um, we have this, uh, we, we could think of this as a causal bottle where Y causes X. And that results in a factorization where what is the joint distribution of X and Y in Q, which is in target? It's Q of Y. So it's, you know, what is the target time distribution over the labels times P of X given Y. Now, this equation is trivially true if we change that P to a Q. So when we call it a P, what we're doing is we're basically asserting that this factor doesn't change from training time to target time. So we're saying what doesn't change is the class conditional distribution. Uh, the, the, the proportion of cats can change, but what cats look like doesn't change, right? Now, keep in mind, that's still a strong assumption that might not be true all the time. Like, imagine that you go out and you find that uh, between last year and uh, between 10 years ago and this year, uh, there's many more photographs, uh, you know, higher proportion of photographs of dogs. It doesn't necessarily mean that all breeds of dogs are going to become more common uh, at exactly the same rate, like maybe a uh, particular, just like, I don't know, I think you didn't see as many labradoodles 10 years ago, but now they're very trendy or something like this. So the, the, the point is that this is still a strong assumption, but by really understanding this assumption, um, what, that assumption at least maps onto like a coherent story of how our data is related. And by understanding it, we can kind of work through this problem end to end and see, at least understand why assumptions of some sort are necessary. Um, so, okay, uh, we've got this factorization. This corresponds to the assumption that Y causes X because basically what we're saying is that someone can intervene on Y, but that the, the structural equation or you know, the, the, the conditional probability table or whatever you want to think of by which uh, X derives its value given Y 
doesn't change. Like that edge is unchanged. It's just somebody's put their finger on the label distribution. Um, so this is um, what, what, what Bernard Shulkoff in this nice paper uh, on causal and anti-causal learning he calls the anti-causal setting. And I think it's something worth just digesting because it sometimes requires some deprogramming for, for, for ML practitioners that we often tell a story about data when we're uh, introducing statistical regression that says X causes Y. Like when, when, when you draw out the linear regression model, you say, well, X comes from some distribution and then my Ys are generated by some linear function of X plus a noise term, right? And when you write that equation, that's not actually an equation, that's an assignment operation, right? Y is not equal to something plus a random variable. Y is sampled uh, from, um, like this is, this is a process by which an X turns into a Y. You know, we take, we take it, we sample an X, we, we run it through a linear function, we sample some noise added to it, and then we assign this to the corresponding Y. Um, but very often, um, you're not trying to predict the effect from the cause. So sometimes you are, like in forecasting, you're trying to predict the future, which presumably is like caused by the past. Um, unless you're like uh, a physicist in the 1600s. Um, however, um, the, a lot of problems correspond to the opposite setting, the anti-causal setting, where you're actually trying to predict the cause from the effect. And medical diagnosis is like this. Like we, we, we see the symptoms and we want to predict the diagnosis, right? And here's uh, the key difference is that, um, you know, it flips what we can assume is uh, invariant. So a lot of people want to assume that uh, the, you know, probability of Y given X is invariant, but actually in, 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 a, in, in a, the label shift problem, that's just not true. Um, and here's an example would be uh, if you saw someone See, I used to give like a example with like the zombie apocalypse. And that was, I'd say, is if you saw, if you knew the first uh, symptom of becoming a zombie was something, um, but now that we have a real pandemic, uh, I can use the pandemic. If you saw someone in October, last October, and they had a fever, the probability of coronavirus given fever was close to zero. Um, you know, suddenly months later, now that the prevalence of coronavirus has gone from like zero people to, um, God, I don't know what the world case count is. I think the US, it's about like 60,000 new confirmed cases per day, or something wild. Um, you get the idea. If you see someone right now, I think in a lot of places, um, I'm actually working a bit on COVID tracking efforts to actually get to apply some of these um, methodologies, um, you know. Um, I think it's something like 14% of all hospital visits in many states uh, are, are due to coronavirus. Um, and so basically, the point is that if you see someone today and they have a fever, instantly your probability that they have coronavirus is way, way, way higher than it would have been eight months ago. The probability of symptoms given to coronavirus has changed, uh, at least you know, within, within an age group or something. It's what's changed probability of coronavirus and that you know basically um in the anti-causal setting this actually flips the probability of this actually means that in general the probability of y given x you know does change um so uh the question then is um how how can we sort of estimate the target uh, label distribution without actually seeing any uh, actually seeing any labels in the target data uh just by comparison covariate shift is the opposite so notice that here we have it's q of x times p of y given x and, and so covariate shift is, is the exact opposite assumption. And in general, covariate shift, if you have a very good classifier and you don't have model misspecification, is not so big of a problem. Um, where it becomes a big problem is like when you have shifts in support. So you actually need some kind of additional structural assumption. We'll get to that a bit later. Um, um, uh, just, you know, one reason why maybe covariate shift seems natural and important to people is that, um, you know, insofar as you want to relate the source of the target distribution, covariate shift, you want to estimate something like, uh, at least when the supports are matched, like the likelihood ratio, Q of X over P of X. And it's obvious how you could try to do this because you do have samples X from P and X from Q. Um, in label shift, you don't have samples of, uh, um, you don't have, sorry, you don't, in domain, you don't have samples of Y from Q. And so it's less obvious immediately. How are you going to estimate Q of Y divided by P of Y? So I'll, I'll walk through just uh, our first attempt at this. 
um, which is to give uh, a consistent estimator of the target label distribution. Um, it has some intuitive error bounds. Its accuracy doesn't depend directly on the, the input data dimension. And uh, the way this is going to interact with deep learning is that um, we're going to use off-the-shelf black box predictors. And I think this is one of the ways that deep learning is interesting now. People see deep learning and often think like to leverage deep learning for it to be exciting, you have to uh, actually work on neural network architectures. And you know, indeed, like early in my PhD, that was, you know, we did plenty of work that was like that. But now I think more often that's becoming maybe maybe comparatively less exciting. Um, and I think what's more exciting personally is to um, not to sort of look at, uh, you know, how do we make small tweaks to how we train neural networks to make them slightly more effective, but rather to think, hey, uh, we have really great classifiers. We're really good at function fitting. Um, what does that enable us to do? Um, where, where can, where just, just that, like, you know, it's not obvious that you should be able to have a great classifier that's able to reduce dimensionality from, you know, inputs with hundreds of thousands of dimensions to, you know, these like one dimensional outputs and do it so efficiently. But um, given that we have that, given that we have a good classifier, at least in the context of classification, how do we leverage that to turn it around to doing well at other things? Like, I think GANs are a good example of this. It says, hey, we're good at classification. How do we leverage that to make a model that uh, is good at, you know, uh, generating samples? Uh, so in this case, you know, we're saying, right, we've got a good classifier. How do we label that? How, how do we leverage that to be good at um, uh, uh, label shift estimation? Um, so, you know, the, 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 the model, uh, the approach is not going to make very strong assumptions about the classifier. It's going to make one mild assumption. Um, it's, and it's going to be an adaptive method. So basically, if we have a better classifier, our error bound is going to get tighter. And that's another way, you know, having better classifiers due to advances in deep learning is going to help us. Um, we're not going to require explicitly that the classifier is accurate or calibrated or unbiased. So the assumptions are one, the label shift assumption, which you just described, that P of X given Y equals Q of X given Y. Two, an identifiability assumption, which is sort of unavoidable, that just says, hey, uh, for all the, the Ys that we're trying to predict, we, we must have seen them at training time. Like they must have had non-zero probability at training time. Like if you haven't seen dogs and you haven't seen cats, you're not going to be able to estimate what is the probability of dogs versus cats because you won't even know which label to call dogs versus cats because there's, you know, there's nothing to break the symmetry. So you need to have seen uh, um, every class that you want to predict at target time during training time. Um, there's uh, a line of work about how you could deal with one new class at test time, but I'm not going to go into that now. Um, and that does require also uh, um, an assumption. So the final assumption, the only assumption that's maybe uh, uh, newer here, is we're going to say that our classifier's confusion matrix uh, needs to be invertible. And, and why we need that is going to be sort of obvious in a second. So we can look at the confusion matrices of our classifier. And um, here, I'm basically saying the classifier, now, the, the, the way to think about this is this doesn't actually have to be a real confusion matrix, and this doesn't even have to be a classifier trained on your real data set. However, um, it'll be easiest to think of this as imagine you took your training data, you use most of it uh, to fit a classifier, uh, so you're training data all of it from the source distribution, you use most of it to fit a classifier, and now uh, you have that or you have that classifier, and you have some you know validation data from your training distribution that you could use to estimate your confusion matrix, and you also have some unlabeled target data. But for now, what I'm going to say is just take that classifier that you trained and just fix it. It's now just a fixed function, and let's look at the confusion matrices of that classifier on the source distribution and the target distribution. And indeed, these are um, different uh, objects from each other. They're different quantities. They have different values. However, they're only different up to a rescaling of the columns. So um, the column normalize, if we no normalize the columns, so just like, uh, so that they, they all, su each column sums up to one. Um, so basically it becomes like the, the, the if you, each column corresponds to an actual label, each row to a predicted label, um, then uh, basically this is like, if we consider each column to be 
the distribution of, you know, say, what was the classifier output conditioning on what was the actual label. Um, this matrix is actually um, identical on the source and target distribution for any fixed classifier. And the reason why is because, well, you know, when you condition on Y, the input is drawn from P of X given Y. And P of X given Y is the same in both source and target. And so F of P of X given Y, you know, or F of samples, you know, the push forward uh, of P of X given Y through F is going to be the same on both source and target. So these, you know, once we call them normalized, these are actually the same matrix. Now we can only estimate this matrix using data from the source distribution because estimating this matrix requires that we have the actual label. So we could decide, you know, which column each example belongs to. Um, so the question is, what do we do with the target data? Because we can't make this matrix. And what we could do with the target data is we could just run it all through our classifier and just take the average classifier output. And if you take the mean classifier output on the right and you take the, the confusion matrix on the left and you say, how are these objects related to each other? Um, anybody want to uh, share in the chat? Uh, how they're related to each other? So on the left is the um, column, uh, the, the column normalized of a class conditioned uh, confusion matrix where each column sums up to one and is basically just telling you what was the distribution of classifier outputs. Like just think of this as multi-class given the actual label. On the right hand side, what you have, and remember the, the object on the left can be estimated from source data, uh, um, but it's actually the, the thing you're estimating is an identical quantity and source and target. And that comes for free via the label shift assumption. That's the role the assumption is playing. On the right, uh, what we're doing is what we have is just a mean classifier output. So how are, how are these quantities related to each other? Everybody uh, speak up at once. Uh, they can't be identical because the object on the left is a uh, is a k by k matrix, so k is a number of labels. Uh, the object on the right is um, just a vector, a one by k or k by one. Uh, vector of um, uh, just the um, the mean classifier output on the target data. So it's a k by k matrix on the left and a, a k dimensional vector on the right. Exactly, it's a linear combination of the columns, right? Because what is the mean classifier output on the target data? Well. Um, the target data has some underlying label distribution, right? Um, and the mean classifier output is going to be, well, what fraction of the time does it actually belong to class one times what is the uh, mean classifier output when it's actually class one plus what is the you know, fraction of time that it's actually class two? This, like these quantities that we care about, the coefficients of the combination actually are the, 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 the target label uh, actually are the target label marginal. This is the object that we want. Um, uh, so nice job, Taha. Um, but this, this is exactly it, right? So this is a linear combination. The solution to the linear combination is the label distribution in the target data. So because the confusion matrix is the same, right? We can just solve for this. We just, and then, you know, keep in mind this equation over here is, uh, or the equation here over the right, whatever, this, this is only true of um, th this is expressed not in terms of the estimated confusion matrix that you get from samples of the data and the estimated mean classifier output. This is uh, true of the uh, like true theoretical underlying confusion matrix. Like if you had an infinite number of samples uh, and on the right. So th then what we need to do, the next step is to figure out, well, what happens when you actually uh, try to solve this equation, but instead of uh, using the real confusion matrix, you're plugging in the estimated confusion matrix, right? Because you don't have an infinite number of samples. Um, so what we can see is that basically we can prove that this is consistent. Uh, and it just requires proving that basically the, mat the confusion matrix is going to converge uh, to its expectation. It's going to converge to its actual, the, the empirical confusion matrix will converge to the 
uh, actual theoretical confusion matrix, the empirical mean classifier output will converge to the actual um, you know, population mean classifier output on the target data. And that we need to prove that sort of with high probability, um, if the real confusion matrix was invertible, uh, the, the empirical confusion matrix will also be invertible. And now you see why you need the invertibility, which is because we're solving a linear system here. So if, if, if the confusion matrix is not invertible, then um, um, suddenly um, we, we might not even be able to uh, have an expressive enough uh, um, uh, confusion matrix that we can capture any, anything that, that would happen at a target time. Um, so, um, there we go, right? So the estimator is just the solution to this linear system. Um, I, it's easy to go back and forth just by changing this confusion matrix from now the, see, if you change that back from the y given, y hat given y matrix to the y hat comma y matrix, the joint, like just not column normalize it, then all that you've done is you've just, um, uh, uh, your solution just now, you just have to take, your solution is not, is no longer the uh, vector of, uh, the target label distribution, but it's actually the vector of importance weights. So every quantity in this W corresponds to Q of Y divided by P of Y. So Q of Y one divided by P of Y one, like the, the likelihood ratio of each label in target versus source. So you, um, so basically, right, you, you can get that if you just invert the C of Y hat comma Y um, uh, and um, dot it with a mean classifier output. Um, and if you just uh, multiply, you know, each, each uh, entry by the corresponding P of Y, which you can estimate from source data, because you, you know the source label distribution quite well, because you've seen a lot of source labels, um, and assuming you have a small number of categories, um, then you can get back the, right, the, the target label distribution. Right, so we talked about the fact that it's consistent, that we just need that these things converge to their expectations. Um, and now we can say, well, there's another kind of insight that we can get from looking at this um, equation, which is that when we look at this equation and say, okay, if this confusion matrix is invertible, then we know that they, and the label shift assumption holds, which, which are both, you know, um, maybe the first assumption is uh, weak, the second assumption is strong. Um, if that's true, then what it says is that um, Q of Y uh, has changed if and only if our mean classifier output has changed, right? Because this is a, this is a, uh, uh, a non-degenerate linear system. So a different value of Q uniquely specifies a different value of the mean classifier output and vice versa. Um, so what that tells us is if we believe that, you know, so this is the strong assumption that the label shift assumption has sort of, um, you know, the, 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 this, this is what the strong, this strong assumption has given us is the ability to make a statement now that, you know, if, you know, we're concerned about distribution shift and we believe the, the label shift assumption, then, you know, the, all we would need to do in order to detect shift is um, to just detect a change in our mean classifier output. Um, if nothing else, you know, we can back out from the mean. If nothing else, it's told us at least that already that the classifier outputs are themselves sort of sufficient for detecting shift. So, you know, once, you know, basically what it means is, you know, we already know that two sample testing is really hard in high dimensions and really sample and efficient. But it says, hey, if you have a good classifier such that you can construct this confusion matrix where this whole thing is true, then actually uh, you've turned your high dimensional two sample testing problem into a uh, low dimensional two sample testing problem. And you, you get that sort of for free just by virtue of, you know, there existing good classifiers out there that can handle high dimensional data. So this is now, I think, why some of these things that look like classical statistical problems also have, um, you know, start having a flavor of deep learning is that, um, you know, if you're just thinking in, about an abstract problem, you don't necessarily care about X versus Y. If you're a machine learning practitioner and you're living in the world where X is a hundred thousand dimensional object and Y is often like a binary label or, you know, 10 class classification or something like that, suddenly, uh, being able to work in Y space versus X space becomes uh, really important and valuable. Um, so right now that we have this, basically it says, hey, we could use this kind of insight to detect shift. 
So just by performing, say, like a likelihood ratio test on the outputs of uh, the classifier. And indeed, um, the method performs really well. So you can see, um, and this is compared to sort of like, uh, you know, like kernel to sample testing approaches, you know, that are based on, on X versus Y. Um, you see that, you know, we were able to control type one error uh, when there's no shift, we don't have a, a, a lot of false positives. When there's a, a mild amount of shift, we're able to detect it much better than other methods. Um, when uh, there's uh, a sort of extreme amount of shift, we're able to detect, detect it sort of just like trivially easily. Um, in general, uh, you know, we've done some experiments to just sort of show the effect that, you know, as your classifier gets better, uh, so it, we do experiments where we just like train the classifier for different amounts of time. The better the classifier gets, the, um, the, the more effective uh, it is at detecting shift. We can also just look at our estimates and quantify how good are our estimates of the label distribution by mean squared error. So to do these experiments, what we basically do is um, we simulate shifts. So we have a data set that we know, and we basically we, we, we decide you know, in constructing the experiment that, OK, even though you were trained on some data um, you know, with, with a certain label distribution, at test time, uh, you're going to have a different label distribution. Um, and, and, you know, we could, we can sample that say from like a Dirichlet. Um, so here, this is Dirichlet with different, uh, concentration parameters. Um, and, um, you can sample the label distribution and then now say, uh, create a data set of X's where you've just sampled with replacement according to the prescribed, uh, label distribution. And then we could try to estimate, you know, the model doesn't know what was the label. So, so now we're, we run an experiment to see, can the model recover? the known label distribution. And so you see here is that indeed um, uh, our, our method, you know, we said that the, the approach was um, um, uh, consistent. Um, and, and indeed, as n grows larger and larger, um, our error continues to fall. Notice that um, in practice, you know, even though I, I'm sure you could do some analysis with the kernel methods where you say, well, as the data set grows larger and larger and larger, I could take the kernel bandwidth to zero and like maybe actually make it consistent. But in practice, um, you're sort of limited by the fact that we just don't have great kernels for, uh, for images. Um, and you're not able to, to get a competitive uh, result here for, for estimation. Um, now you could apply the kernel method on the outputs, which then becomes kind of sort of the same thing. But it's sort of the, the, the key insight here is, is that Leveraging the black box predictor is what makes these things effective. Um, so we also uh, can incorporate this to improving our classifiers. So we can take it, we can go back to our classifier, and we can, um, the, one of the most common things to do uh, to try to incorporate some, some knowledge of distribution shift when the supports are matched is um, uh, to reweight the training data and train using empirical, uh, you know, importance-weighted empirical risk minimization. Um, now, I'm going to describe uh, in a few minutes why that's maybe not the best idea in the world um, in the context of the first paper. That was our first attempt, and we got interesting results. Um, but um, there's reason to think that maybe we need a better way to, to incorporate this information into updating our classifier, um, both from a standpoint of efficiency and also from a standpoint of like uh, efficacy. So. Now, I, we don't have too much time. I'll over very briefly that um, this isn't the only approach uh, to working on this, um, uh, to solving this problem. And in fact, there's another approach that's in the literature. So that was an approach that you know, um, we analyzed and um, you know, proved was consistent um, and established error bounds for. Um, there's another approach uh, that we call, um, some people call it EM in the literature. It doesn't actually require EM, but um, we could call it, it's basically maximum likelihood, but uh, the, the approach is sort of described in some papers sort of procedurally. And the, the way it was originally introduced was this. It says, hey, let's, let's assume that the label distribution was the same. Let's use it to get out a set of predictions on the test data. Then when you look at the test data and you look at, you know, what were the uh, for every single sample, you can, you, can, you can average those, you can sum them up, essentially. Um, and, and now you could say, um, 
Right. So, right. You can, you can average these over the data set. And when you average them over the data set, you can now say, okay, now I get an updated belief about what is the, um, the label distribution. And the proposal is that, well, then you could take that and go back and um, reweight your classifier outputs to recompute the predictions, use the predictions to recompute the marginal. Use the marginal to recompute the predictions, you know, via the likelihood ratio reweighting, and then use that to re update the marginal. So already for this part of the process, for this to actually make sense, you have to believe that your classifier outputs actually are probabilities. And actually for this to make sense, you have to believe at, that they're calibrated probabilities. So that's a strong assumption. In general, neural network outputs are not calibrated. Calibration is a hard open uh, problem. Um, actually uh, figuring, you know, there, there's approaches, like for example, there's this uh, expected calibration error uh, metric that's uh, in, in a nice paper by Killian Weinberger that sort of empirically showed that neural networks are very overconfident, but you can get them at least by this metric uh, close to looking pretty good by just tuning the softmax temperature. However, um, it's, it, 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 it's, um, there's many um, notions of calibration and expected calibration error on the predicted class is, is only one and it's actually a very weak one. So you need a stronger notion of calibration here in order to um, even make just one update of this, like just update your beliefs given the new uh, estimated label distribution to make that coherent. Um, um, now the question here is, let, let's say that your classifier, um, you, you, you weren't worried about, you know, how I put it? Let's say that your classifier, uh, your question is like, what is this approach actually doing? And um, when does it make sense? So this approach, uh, it turns out is basically what you're doing is you're doing maximum likelihood estimation of the target label distribution under the assumption that, so you can interpret this approach, you can work it out, and it turns out you can say, um, oh, by the way, and, and when people apply this, using um, box classifiers, it performs much worse than uh, our proposed confusion matrix, like moment matching approach. But when people uh, calibrate it with temperature scaling, it also performs worse. Um, but then when people use a sort of fancier, more flexible calibration heuristic called bias corrected temperature scaling, it performs much better than BBSE. This is already surprising. His approach, nothing is proven about it. Um, is it consistent? What are you actually estimating? Does it actually converge to anything as you get lots of samples? Not established. Whereas our approach, we're actually saying you converge infinitely close. You know, as you get more and more data, it's truly consistent. You're going to converge to the exact right label distribution. Um, here, we're saying we have an approach, we have no idea why it works, but it's actually working better in practice with this heuristic. So what's going on here? Um, and, and in general, maybe the sort of meta point of, of a flavor of what this problem is communicating is that there's an interesting dance between, um, you know, figuring out what you're trying to estimate, identifying that quantity, and then this, the next step, which is figuring out um, how should I estimate it? What are the best estimation procedure? And um, sort of we sort of, uh, our approach sort of solves the identification problem. It says, hey, here's an estimation. Here's an estimate that like is consistent. But you know, there's nothing in our approach from the previous slides that says we're guaranteed to be the best approach or we're guaranteed to be the most efficient statistical estimator. So it turns out that this other approach, this alternating minimization thing that people are calling EM, well, it, it's literally just doing maximum likelihood. And it's doing max likelihood under the assumption that the classifier is actually like it's only actually max likelihood estimation um, of like the right quantity um, at least obviously if your classifier truly is the real underlying conditional probability of y given x which you never have in reality right in fact um, for a lot of these data sets like um, um, like images uh, a lot of these data sets actually really the label's deterministic, right? Like the cat is a cat with 100% probability in the, in the true underlying reality. Um, so any kind of uncertainty is actually has to do with modeling. It's not, so, um, so the point here is that, you know, you have this approach, uh, this approach 
if you core, if you actually, your classifier actually give you the true conditional probabilities is doing maximum likelihood um, and identifies the right parameter. However, we don't actually uh, have uh, the true like Bayes optimal classifier just sitting around. We're using our neural network that we trained. And it's not clear, no one was sure. Um, and so this is work by my uh, student Sarab Garg and also a uh, collaboration with uh, Ifan Wu, a senior student in the lab and uh, Siva Balakrishnan. We looked at it and tried to say, well, what, when actually um, is this approach correct? Like what is the minimal set of assumptions for this approach to actually be consistent? Um, and can it be consistent, you know, even if it's misspecified? Um, so we actually analyze it. It turns out, interestingly enough, that it requires two assumptions for this to make sense. One, the classifier has to satisfy uh, calibration. And it's a little bit, uh, the unsettling part is it has to satisfy the very most strict form of calibration that I know, which is something called canonical calibration, um, which is not actually guaranteed by any of these methods, but maybe you believe that in practice, uh, you get something uh, close. And um, it seems that in practice, this BCTS thing on neural networks on these image tasks, you know, maybe does give you something nice. Um, the, the other thing that you need actually is that the, essentially a, con a, a, a condition that turns out to be the exact same condition that we required before, which is that the confusion matrix is invertible. Um, so, uh, you know, we can compare these approaches and th already, you know, the, the approaches are sort of different in two key ways. Um, so one is that in one case we're doing moment matching, the other one we're doing max likelihood. However, um, my student um, uh, Sarab had a really interesting uh, insight, which is that a confusion matrix itself actually can perform calibration. It's an extremely blunt way of performing calibration, right? You say whenever the predicted class is cat, I'm just going to look up and say, what are, is the distribution of actual classes given that predicted class? And just always output that same quantity. So basically, your, your classifier becomes, loses a lot of information. You're not outputting continuous values. You're outputting one of k values. And it's the corresponding you know, row of the confusion matrix. So when you do that, you've calibrated your classifier. And then you could use that calibration. You know, you've calibrated it. You, know, you actually eventually you know, this would actually accomplish canonical calibration. You can run this in the max likelihood world um, with, that con with the confusion matrix calibration and see how you, how you perform. So there's sort of two differences. You could think of one key is, am I doing max likelihood versus moment matching? The other kind of difference is you could think actually is just um, what kind of calibration am I using? If I think of the confusion matrix itself as doing calibration, why should I use some other calibration heuristic other than this very blunt, you know, uh, confusion matrix cal calibration? And indeed, we ran a whole bunch of experiments, and the really interesting, exciting finding here is that doing the max likelihood approach, where you use a confusion matrix for calibration, performs almost exactly the same as our moment matching approach. So it turns out the difference between moment matching and uh, uh, max likelihood is like non-existent um, in practice, right? So what really matters actually is um, what kind of, we could think of it all as basically being, you know, the only difference is a change of the objective function. So we could think of it as, we, we could think of this as maybe, we, it, we could think of it as all as doing max likelihood, but the difference among the methods really being what is your choice of a calibration heuristic. Um, and so BDSC, it's sort of, it's clear, sorry, it's clear uh, with the confusion matrix calibration, that you should actually get something close to canonical calibration. It's not quite clear um, why uh, you know, any of these other heuristics should do better. Um, and so uh, we looked really deeply into this. And so we published a, a, we posted a paper, I think we'll be publishing soon, um, uh, called a unified view of label shift estimation that basically unifies these sort of two approaches um, through that combination of experiment and theory. And uh, among other things, we showed that um, if you just, uh, if you have a, say, like a bin calibration method, as, the, as a calibration method for a large amount of data, as you have more and more bins, as the calibration becomes more and more granular, even though you're identifying the, causal, the, 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 the label distribution with a smaller, you know, with a coarser calibration, as the calibration becomes finer and more granular, your estimate actually is getting more accurate. Um, and we're able to sort of work out an error bound that sort of uh, explains this, that actually your error depends on sort of two things. 
One is your estimation error in finite samples, and the other is your calibration error. I'm going to use the more, the more um, coarse calibration method. You lower your calibration error, but you're also throwing out information. Like if you replace your classifier output, con rich continuous values, with just um, one of k values every time, then what you're actually um, uh, doing is you're, you're in a sense like, it's like you're, you're, you're decreasing the Fisher information. You're increasing your finite sample error because uh, you actually are, are decreasing like the, um, uh, the, 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 the Fisher information and, and, and therefore like it, your sort of sample, sample efficiency properties are becoming less favorable even as um, your, your calibration error is going down. Um, so when we go through uh, at Blitzby, I think we only have a few more minutes, is just some follow-ups that we had um, to show how like now that we have these insights, we actually uh, can have a whole, even if we don't believe that label shift holds in the real world, you know, we can get a whole bunch of downstream insights that all sort of start from the, this initial like line of inquiry. The first is how do we detect shift in general um, and in practice? And one thing that, you know, comes out of our approach is sort of saying, hey, um, there's maybe a more general pipeline for detecting shift here, which is um, we know that detecting shift is efficient in lower dimensions. We know that classifiers perform dimensionality reduction for us. And we even know that that, that dimensionality reduction performed by the classifier in the case of label shift is a sufficient representation for doing uh, shift detection. So it says, now that we've got that, is there anything actually special about what we did? Or could we have gotten just as good detection results if we did, you know, insert your favorite uh, dimensionality reduction method here, insert your favorite two sample test here. Um, you know, could we just in general have done, you know, could we have uh, worked with, uh, um, what would have happened, you know, let's have a naive baseline. What would happen if we did no dimensionality reduction? What would have happened if we just used PCA for dimensionality reduction or random predictions? What happened if we trained an autoencoder or if we used an untrained autoencoder? Um, what would happen if we use, uh, um, right, you know, our, our, our method, the, 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 the black box shift detection, what would happen if we use a classifier that's explicitly trained to discriminate among the source and target distribution? And then we further ask the question is, how well do these methods perform in practice, even when the label assumption is violated? So even when there's like, you know, all other kinds of changes, rotations, uh, you know, kind of weird things that show up on standard domain adaptation benchmarks, because keep in mind here, we're not trying to estimate the label distribution. Even if we violate estimation, we just want to see, are we still able to detect shift when it happens in general? Um, and interestingly, across a wide battery of problems, it seems that the, using the, 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 the outputs of the classifier trained on the source task as your sort of representation for doing shift detection performs better across this whole menu of thousands of different experiments. This is an aggregate result. Um, it's maybe more informative to look at the uh, individual results, but you see when we, have, for example, have, um, um, you know, this is some data, it's like a composition of a bunch of different data augmentation mechanisms on top of label shift, um, uh, that, that uh, black box shift detection using the, using the, the soft classifier outputs um, performs by, by far the best. Um, interestingly, the story is flipped around when we look at adversarial examples. So when it comes to adversarial examples, we're able to detect them um, with p-values at like zero, um, with a very small number of samples. Um, and we're able to detect them actually doing the weirdest thing. The e like the easiest way to detect, uh, if, you're, if you're able to look at a data set, you just want to say, um, is that data set different from the source? So, you know, some frac you know, and, and the source of the difference is some fraction of it is perturbed with adversarial perturbations. The easiest giveaway seems to be, now obviously you could turn around and try to come up with an attack that would fool this too. But the easiest giveaway seems to be actually looking at the raw features themselves. Now, when you look at the raw features and individually look and say, like, is, you know, the feature distribution for any one of those, any single individual pixel value different, you're, you're performing a two-sample a two test at every single pixel location. So you have to do some extremely absurd correction to your critical value to make this a, a valid test. Even after that correction, remarkably, um, uh, the, the raw pixels uh, perform far better than almost anything else for detecting adversarial examples. That's, I think, an interesting, weird finding. Um, so, uh, another follow-up I'll blow through quickly is, you know, we fixed label shift, uh, or a fix, but we sort of used the new label shift estimate to update our classifier on the fly before um, by um, doing importance-weighted risk minimization. 
But an important way to risk minimization should sort of like uh, actually bother you a little bit because it's sort of only well uh, justified or well motivated under model misspecification. So uh, like this is, uh, you know, like from the classic uh, covariate shift paper, um, it's like, you know, if you're trying to fit like this kind of uh, quadratic pattern with uh, a linear model, then whether you disproportionately sample from the left or the right, hi Ruth, um, uh, it really makes a difference because you're going to get this uh, black line on the left versus on the right. Um, and so something that bothered me um, and uh, from listening to a, a theory talk by Nati Cerebro was that he was describing, you know, we're generally training neural networks in this over-parameterized regime where we're fitting the data kind of perfectly during training and then, you know, having some error on the holdout data. And one thing that bothered me was sort of, if you're fitting the data perfectly, um, then sort of uh, you can drive your loss arbitrarily close to zero. And you don't just drive it close to zero for one choice of the importance weights, you drive it close to zero for all choices of the importance weights. And so then basically what difference, if any, does the choice of importance weights actually make? Do they actually influence optimization? And so Nati gave this talk about uh, analyzing just linear neural networks, just to understand what happens when you train them on separable data. Um, and you know, all, we, all we're talking about here is that the training set is separable, not necessarily that the true distribution is separable. And indeed, what they found is that uh, even though you train with log loss and you think you're doing this kind of probabilistic thing, when you train in the over-parameterized setting and perfect, using gradient descent and actually perfectly separate the data, um, and they have all these follow-up results from GD to SGD, fixed learning rates to ConvNets to, you know, to, or linear ConvNets and uh, deep linear ConvNets, um, they find that actually what you converge to is the max margin solution. And that should sort of bother you because the max margin solution uh, actually doesn't depend um, upon the importance weights at all. It's a, it doesn't matter if you double sample the positive points or the negative, uh, the, the separator is going to be in the same location. Um, and indeed, we looked back and said, well, what happens with neural networks um, when we train them? What actually is the effect of the importance weights? Um, now, th this convergence that, that uh, uh, Daniel, Sudri, and, and, and Nazi describe is something that happens very slowly over a long period of time. So we looked and say, does this also happen in neural networks? Um, and indeed, it does. Um, and this is weird. I, and when I say it does, I, I, I don't mean that we get the max margin solution or even how to interpret that uh, in, in a giant neural network and multi-class classification. What I mean to say is that um, the phenomena that the importance weights don't matter and precisely that they don't matter in a way that like the effect of importance weighting fades over the course of training epochs um, indeed happens here. So we, we go back and look and it seems that um, you know, if you, you're basically upweighting uh, dogs versus cats um, and you're looking at weights in a huge range, you know, you're, you're, you're totally messing with, a, you know, effective sample size from like 256 to one in one direction to 256 to one in the other. It's like a, a, a range of like a factor of like a million in the importance weights. You start off with the importance weights in early epochs having a dramatic effect on the, the learned model in terms of, say, the fraction of holdout images classified as one class or another. But as you train... Uh, these models in a way that you know sort of depends upon the importance weight itself uh, eventually converge to uh, classifying a, a fixed fraction that sort of doesn't really depend on the weights at all and so um, anyway so I think we're at the limit but um, no, no yeah so, uh, <laughs> yeah so anyway the high level point here is that you know th there's a lot of temptation I think to just sort of uh, finick with neural networks and throw them at these problems and say did it work on this one data set or is it robust but I sort of encourage an alternative approach to these kinds of problems, which is figure out, can you really understand some kind of principle for which domain adaptation is actually like well-specified and coherent, and then start build on some kind of coherent framework and actually, you know, work out to all the consequences and, um, you know, how you can apply this. Are some of the tools that you develop actually applicable even when the assumptions don't hold? And often they are. Um, so, you know, in short, um, to kind of summarize, we talked about the fact that um, in general, most of the machinery that we have in machine learning that um, sort of like actually works, so to speak, or, or, or works in the sense of like is deployed in systems or we, uh, you know, have, have, have sort of, uh, you know, 
yeah, almost any real world system actually driving machine learning or sort of slated to drive some kind of critical machine learning system in the real world uh, depends either on uh, supervised learning or, you know, sometimes uh, very, very rarely reinforcement learning. Um, in either case, we make uh, certain kind of assumptions about stability over time. Um, the reinforcement learning case is a little bit richer, but we usually assume that the, the reward dynamics and that the transition dynamics is, are, are static over time. Um, in a supervised learning case, we really truly assume that the entire distribution of observations is, is static over time. And, um, you know, we started off with a lot of the motivation for why this is problematic. Uh, the fact that uh, this sort of leaves you in the wind when uh, there's anyone with sort of any conflicting motive um, uh, that doesn't necessarily align with those of uh, the system you're building um, that has some ability to intervene in the data. So one example of this is the kind of threat models modeled by adversarial examples. Uh, we talked about the fact that just even in the absence of um, a concerted effort to thwart your model, that there's, um, you know, just in general, the normal state of affairs is that the world changes. So if you're, you know, trying to recognize things in radiology, uh, equipment is going to continue to change and evolve over time. Usually in a way that's, you know, for, from the standpoint of humans, usually in stamp equipment is evolving in a way that is um, beneficial, that is making the task easier. But um, from a uh, machine learning perspective, uh, sort of any kind of change to the distribution um, is potentially uh, sort of perilous. Um, and models that, you know, uh, seem to perform well at a task may fail at even what sort of semantically appears to be the very same task, just in a world where uh, data looks slightly different. So images are slightly changed, a uh, style of writing is slightly different. Um, and then, you know, we talked about how not only is this a, a, a really fundamental problem uh, that needs to be addressed, but it's not actually a problem. It is, it is many different problems and that in general, they, they are underspecified. So uh, if, if I only give you data from the source distribution and I give you data from the target distribution and I just say, uh, it's labeled data from the source distribution, unlabeled data from the target. And I say, uh, you know, do domain adaptation that this sort of makes no sense by itself um, because there's multiple reasonable assumptions I could make that would sort of make this problem coherent. But each one is going to tell me something different about what, you know, the right thing to do is for how to make predictions in the test set. And not only is each one uh, going to tell me something different, but each of these assumptions actually is like, could in some, you know, a large subset of real world examples be reasonable. Um, and so we took one simple assumption, which was, you know, we looked at the label shift assumption where we assumed that the distribution of labels is changing, but that's all that's changing. So the P of X given Y does not change and showed how if, if you make that assumption, you're able to derive the machinery to detect shift, to estimate it, to correct your classifier on the fly. Um, and you're able to do this quite effectively. Um, and the challenge then is to say, well, uh, you know, that's great, but also what can we do for, uh, in general, in the real world where um, these assumptions, you know, or, or, or so facile assumption might not hold. And so um, there's, there's been a lot of work. For example, one thing that we assume in the distribution shift work uh, that we talked about in the label shift work, and that's also a standard assumption in classical works on covariate shift, is that basically the, the supports are the same, right? So any label, uh, basically any example that has non-zero probability uh, in the source distribution or in the target distribution also has it in the source distribution. And you see people, you know, looking at data sets wanting to do domain adaptation in deep learning, and they have a data set and something like the source data set is photographs of products on white backgrounds from Amazon. And then the target distribution is something like photographs of those same products in the wild on arbitrary backgrounds and arbitrary lighting conditions. And these images have zero probability of showing up in source data. Source data is like a distribution that by definition consists only of images on white backgrounds. And so what, if anything, could be done there? Um, 
I'll give an example of an approach, a family of approaches that's kind of interesting, um, but also problematic, and where maybe the you know the the current like climate and ML community resulted in like thousands of papers adopting this kind of approach uncritically without thinking through the assumptions. Um, where I think a lot of these things could have been really obvious, and we could have saved a lot of time if you know we uh, situated this in sort of things that we already know. So, so one kind of interesting intuition that came up in a paper in around 2015 or 2016 was this idea that we could sort of, um, uh, this is, well, you know, hey, let's say I have a big data set of images from one distribution. And so in this case, uh, the paper doesn't make it explicit, I don't believe, um, but you know, they're working under the covariate shift assumption, right? That we're basically assuming um, that if you fix an image, uh, its label is the same. So you're working in a case where you're thinking of like uh, object recognition, something like that. And the idea is, hey, I have a pile of images um, uh, from source. I have some images from target. Um, they look different, um, but you know, I think they depict the images from you know, the same set of classes. Uh, how can I make a classifier that's gonna leverage the unlabeled target data to predict well? Um, uh, to, to sort of develop a class, you know, predict better than if I just threw the, the vanilla source train classifier at that data. And the idea they came up with is to say, hey, uh, and there, there's a bunch of different variants of this. So there's Dan, there's Ada, there's a bunch of others. That basically says, let, let's learn a representation. Let's learn a mapping such that I can encode, uh, I can encode my data from the source distribution and I can encode my data from the target distribution. And the hope is let's encode them into a common latent space such that there's a, we can apply a classifier on top, like an adversarial, like a, like it's not really, okay, what makes it, the classifier from its perspective is just a classifier. It takes that representation as an input and it just tries to predict which domain did this data point come from. So this classifier is trained both on the data from the source distribution and from the target distribution. You know, during training, you grab batches of each, you feed them through, and this guy tries to distinguish, is it from source or target? Um, now you also uh, train a, a model uh, only on the source data because you only have labels in the source data. We're given the, that representation of the source data point, you try to predict what is the corresponding class label. Um, and the idea is that you update the encoder so that the classification uh, gets more accurate, but so that the domain classification gets less accurate. The idea is to like domain confusion. You wanna learn a representation such that the source data is classified accurately but that the domain uh, classifier uh, gets confused. And the, the thought is that if you can't, if, if the model was fooled so it couldn't tell the source versus target data, then you have somehow aligned the source versus target distributions. So I think at an intu level of intuition, this is sort of sounds reasonable and it sounds kind of cute. Um, and indeed some of the experiments are, are kind of suggestive um, that, you know, uh, you know, again, domain adaptation, there's your, your data set becomes, your, your your data set size becomes, you know, the effective data set size is not really the number of examples anymore, but the number of domains. And you're only looking at one or two domains. So it's, it's a little bit of a funny kind of eval when you see a sort of out of domain evaluation. But, you know, the fact that you do so much better on some of these tasks seems um, a little bit intriguing. However, you know, the, the authors also, they sort of invoke a lot of this work, um, uh, uh, a known uh, result from, from learning theory from Scheib and David, which says that, uh, uh, hey, when, when you're doing domain adaptation, uh, there's a way to decompose, or not just to decompose actually, but to, to upper bound the, the, the target uh, error um, as a sum of three terms. You're able to bound the, the target error um, by a sum of the, the source error, um, uh, a divergence between the representations of the data points, and some uh, more complicated third term. And what uh, this work is doing is essentially minimizing the first two terms. This is I want to lower my target error towards zero, uh, sorry, my source error towards zero, and I want to um, shrink the, the divergence between the representations of the uh, source points and the target points. Um, so if you just look at it on its surface, it sort of seems like, um, you know, the idea sounds intuitive. Um, however, the problem here is the theoretical justification that's given doesn't actually quite uh, add up. And the reason why it doesn't add up is that this minimizing the sum of these three terms is um, sufficient 
but not necessary. Um, so for example, um, uh, yeah, it's efficient, but not necessary in the sense that, um, you know, it, it, it's possible that the, the, the optimal classifier actually has, a, you know, a representation such that that divergence is actually large. Um, it's just saying that if you were able to simultaneously set all these three things to zero, then the target error would be low. Um, so this approach, uh, it turns out when you minimize these first two terms, there exists a lot of problems where by minimizing the, the, the first two terms, uh, you actually force the third term to grow really large. And the problem is that when the first term is zero, if, if the third term is large, that third term actually is an irreducible, like lower bound um, on, the, uh, on, on the target error. So, so it's like by driving up that third term, you really truly are uh, driving up the target error. Um, and so you, you sort of adopt an approach. And the question is, you could step back and say, well, what assumption are they making? What actually makes it possible to do domain application at all? And the answer is, well, the problem's actually underspecified because the supports are mismatched and it's not clear um, why we should expect the right alignment to occur. Um, so this problem is actually more extensive than I'll demonstrate, but I'll just give one example of a, of a clear counterexample that'll tie into the work we did yesterday. Um, in work with my student Yifan Wu, and a similar result was seen in contemporary work by uh, Frederick Johansson, um, we noticed that, um, you know, when does this break down? And one reason, one way that this breaks down is actually when there's label shift, right? So even if, um, even if the classes are fully separated, such that the covariate shift and label shift assumptions could hold simultaneously, what happens is that um, in the case of label shift, if you align the distributions in, like imagine that there's 50% cats, 50% dogs at training, 80% cats, 20% dogs at test. If you've aligned the distribution such that the source and target data are indistinguishable in the latent space, that means that if your classifier is super accurate in source data, it has to be inaccurate in target data because it has to be predicting you know, way, too, uh, way too few cats and way too many dogs. Because if it's predicting 50-50 on source data, it has to predict 50-50 on target data. Otherwise, it's not aligned in the latent space. So to give an example here, you could imagine, uh, look at this uh, diagram and see um, on the right that uh, the only way you could align the source and target data, where in source you have 50-50 negative and positive points, and in right, you know, the positive class dominates, the only way you could align these in the latent space is to have a latent space such that some regions of input space that are uh, really from the positive class in the target data get mapped uh, alongside points in the source space in the source data um, in the latent space. Um, so we uh, actually coming up with a way that guarantees you to get the right alignment requires some strong extra assumptions that you know it's not quite clear what are reasonable ones to make but at the very least we're able to modify those domain in, insofar as you think that there is something that's interesting happening in the, the domain confusion kind of approach, we are able to modify those algorithms in a way where it's still unclear uh, when uh, we should expect them to get the right alignment, but we can at least ensure um, that um, they're not guaranteed to fail in the face of label shift and in practice get them to work. Um, so in short, like the, the approach is a kind of relaxed matching that requires that uh, the, the support and latent space uh, kind of overlaps, but allows that the, not that, that we have, you know, the, the density ratio has to be exactly one everywhere in latent space. It's allowed to be uh, sort of looser. Um, and so when we sort of relax this domain uh, alignment criteria, um, then we're actually able to get results. Uh, like you could see uh, what, what goes wrong is on the left, uh, the source data points are, are the blue and the red. Um, and you see it's balanced classes. And now imagine that your target data was slightly shifted and it was represented by these uh, purple and green points. So in some sense, because there's overlap um, between uh, the source positive and the source negative, uh, sorry, the source positive and the target positive, and there's overlap between the source negative and the target negative, you think that it should maybe be possible to do something here and these models should be able to recover the right alignment, but there's this added problem, which is the label shift. Notice that the blue and the red are 50-50, uh, 
the green and the purple are like, you know, 80, 20 or something like that. And so when you apply off the shelf domain confusion approaches, they need to have the same number of points roughly in positive and negative. And we actually apply the approach with a neural network. This is what, um, uh, the domain confusion approach comes up with here is in the middle where it basically takes those green points and splits them across the classes just so that you can kind of match them in latent space. Um, and indeed, when we use the relaxed criteria, we get something uh, much closer to, to what we really want to get, which is that the green points and the blue points appear to be sort of matched in latent space and the purple and the red uh, appear to be matched in latent space. So this doesn't fully unpack the mystery of why and when uh, and according to what principles uh, the desired alignment should occur from domain, uh, these sort of domain confusion approaches, but it does at least identify uh, and sort of remove one sort of failure case, or at least, you know, um, you know empirically it seems to. So the final thing I'll, I'll point to is kind of like a feature direction that I'm currently doing a lot of work in and super excited about. And as you can see, my student depicted here in the bottom right corner is also uh, very excited about um, is uh, this approach called um, and we call uh, learning with counterfactually augmented data. And so the premise is, you know, uh, sometimes these assumptions like y causes x or x causes y um, are um, things that you know you know we we can look at our data and, and and actually you know we have a few enough variables we can make these kinds of more like facile statements about you know, simple sort of causal relations that hold or simple structure. But with a lot of the kinds of data sets, you know, there's a little bit of a chasm between uh, in the causal inference world, we're talking about uh, small numbers of variables or small numbers of groups of variables where we could make kind of sweeping statements about what is the causal relationship among them. And then the real world, you know, uh, uh, you know, part like what's cool about cause the sort of causal thinking is that it gives you sort of, you can, you can, you can actually develop sort of like philosophically coherent ways of describing this broader set of problems um, and maybe like mathematically coherent uh, machinery for addressing it. But the problem on the other hand is that that world is often, at least at present, not addressing the kinds of huge, messy, complex, like real world high dimensional data sets um, where deep learning is doing some of the most interesting things. So for example, like raw text data or you know, um, images even. So um, one interesting uh, idea that, that you know, I think uh, a number of people are working on that, that, that we uh, kind of really dove into a lot about it, you know, maybe starting a year and a half ago, is this idea of saying, can we incorporate humans in the loop? And some of the things that we have trouble just explicitly stating structural assumptions, can we come up with ways to get a human feedback to help us, I you know, sort of identify what we need to do um, to make uh, sort of you know more robust classifiers. So you know, one you know, we're not just motivated here by the, the, the conventional framing of robustness problems, but we're also thinking about things like in natural language that um, uh, there's a lot of concern. People train a model, it gets high accuracy, and then they look and they find okay, it was uh, doing something. Like it was classifying resumes, but the model uh, uh, learn that uh, to, to prioritize um, uh, women or to prioritize men into down downweight, you know, female applications or something. It was sensitive to to the the gender words, and people say, "Oh, there's bias in um, uh, deep learning. We should be very concerned." And and indeed, we should be concerned about applying kind of technology in some wacky, like unfounded, incoherent way for problems which really are semantically very different from what it was trained for. Um, but, you know, the deeper question here now, not, you know, it's sort of, if we've gotten past the, like, obviously there's a problem here, the question is, what is the nature of the problem actually? And we're discussing the problem in a very sloppy way. We just say, uh, the data is biased, the model's biased, there is, uh, we say, uh, it's learning spurious correlations, it's learning superficial correlations, it's learning, uh, all these, you know, we come up with all these kinds of ways, it's learning the distractors, um, but, uh, it's not quite clear, like, what, what precisely does that mean? What does it mean for the data set to be biased? What does it mean for a correlation to be uh, spurious? And, you know, in statistics, there's one definition of spurious, right, that makes sense, which is basically, you think you see a pattern, but it's uh, only an artifact of a small sample size, and it goes away with a larger sample size. 
But I'd argue the problems here have nothing to do with sample size, what we're talking about in this exact moment here. It's not really about sample size. Um, it's a different kind of spuriousness, and it's one that's not defined well at all within statistics. It's um, uh, something more like the, the, the causal notion. So, so in causality, spuriousness is when you, you learn a pattern that, that sort of arises due to common cause. So like uh, X1 is caused by something and X2 is caused by something. So you learn that they're correlated, but it's not because one causes the other or, or vice versa, but rather because they have common cause. And I think a lot of these problems, that's what we're concerned with is that, you know, um, so, so I'll walk through an example now. Um, but the premise here is, is basically um, here. So, so I'll, I'll start with an example of, you know, if you train uh, a classifier on movie reviews, um, as I'll show soon, if you train a classifier on movie reviews, and let's just say like, you know, you, we, do, we wave our hands a little bit. We use like a traditional model, uh, like a TF-IDF uh, linear model. We train it on movie reviews. We try to predict sentiment, positive or negative. Um, what you'll find is if you, if you then do like the kind of normal, kind of hand wavy uh, data scientist thing of just train the model uh, and then go back and look at the coefficients, and you just did this on like a bag of words representation. You say, what are the positive words? What are the negative words? The positive words, and I'll skip ahead here. You see words like great, fun, excellent, wonderful. But you, see, you also see words like romantic and romance, which are not necessarily saying it's a good movie. Um, the, like romance is a genre, not uh, a quality of the film. And horror, which is a negative, uh, uh, becomes one of your most highly negative words right there with bad, worse, boring, awful, terrible. Even though horror is actually not, you know, saying the movie's bad, it's just a genre movie. There's plenty of amazing horror movies, especially right now. Um, so you see that there's a problem here, which is that the classifier uh, finds these words that are correlated with genre, uh, co correlated with sentiment, but they're not actually like semantically related to sentiment. And so having worked on these domain adaptation problems and thought about it from the, the angle of identifiability, the question is, you know, before you rush out and say, let's create the debiasing algorithm, the question is, can you actually debias this at all? Is it even identifiable which is the distractor versus which is the real feature without actually having some additional information? Is this something that is obvious just from looking at reviews alone? Um, and what we sort of argue is that um, it's not, and that uh, this actually requires um, some kind of structural knowledge, just like any of uh, any problems where you know we want to depend on you know the causal features. We can think of what we want to depend upon in some sense is we want the model to be causal in the sense that we want it to depend upon the features that actually cause the label to be applicable. So what we did is we created an annotation platform, um, and this was a huge amount of work for which 100% uh, of credit of uh, you know building all this infrastructure. I uh, should go to my student, is we, uh, we built an annotation platform and ran uh, a massive uh, experiment with Mechanical Turk. And the normal uh, annotation pipeline goes something like this. You write a review, uh, you, you give someone a review, you ask them for a label. You, know, you give someone the text, you ask them for a label. And what we did instead is we said, here's the original review, here's the original label, which we already know, and below that review, here is an editable text box where you can you know, basically intervene on the review, edit the review. Um, and here's a counterfactual label. Um, and we want you to revise the review so that it agrees with a counterfactual label. And so basically, we give them a few directions. We basically say the document should remain coherent. Um, it should uh, 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 accord with the uh, counterfactual label. So basically, right? It should accord to the counterfactual label. It should remain uh, coherent in that basically, like you shouldn't just change one sentence but leave contradicting sentences. It should, you know, be a natural review. However, you shouldn't make any changes that are sort of semantically unnecessary. Like you shouldn't change any facts that actually don't aren't required to be changed in order to flip the label. So we're saying basically you should just make only the necessary interventions to flip the label uh, from one side to the other to flip the applicable label. Um, and people come up with all kinds of creative ways. You might think that they just would like insert negation in random places, that's always a concern. You know, they're just gonna say, this movie is not great. Um, 
But actually people come up with all kinds of clever ways. They revise the reviews, they change adjectives, they uh, modify the grammar of a sentence to make it look sarcastic. They, um, right, they replace some modifiers. They, um, they kind of come up with like little uh, like ways of um, tempering claims. So the movie becomes, goes from becoming more and more intriguing to only slightly more intriguing. Um, and, and so, so there's a number, you know, the humans are actually quite, you know, uh, creative here, which is interesting because I think there's been previous studies where people ask people to generate text on the spot and they lament that people are rather uncreative and homogenous. And I think part of that is maybe just that uh, it's uh, a lot of pressure and maybe too out of the blue to just ask someone to generate text randomly. But when you give them this prompt and you give them this task, people are actually quite uh, creative. And I showed you before what, what looks like if you train a model on the original data. Um, if you uh, train the model on the, so okay, remember, so we had the original uh, data, then we created a data set where we have basically what we call the counterfactually revised data. For every original data point, you have a corresponding data point with the opposite label, how, where only the, only the things necessary to be changed have changed. So for every positive review, you have a new negative review. So interestingly, if you train on, if you look at this plot, if you train on the revised data only, but not the original data, bad, worst, boring, awful remain negative words, and great, fun, excellent, wonderful remain among the top positive words, but horror and romance actually flip. Romance becomes one of the most negative words, and horror becomes one of the most positive words. And the reason why is because horror was, you know, basically present in almost only negative reviews or, or majority negative reviews before, but in the revised data, all those reviews are now positive reviews, but they still contain the word horror. And so basically what's happened is the human has given us information by virtue of which things they did or didn't edit. So by the fact that they didn't edit certain words, they've revealed to us that these aren't the causal features. So when you take the original data, you get this, you know, the, those features all, all sort of matter. When you take the uh, counterfactually revised data, the, those features all matter but have the opposite effect. But when you combine those two data sets together, which is the old plus the new, what we call the counterfactually augmented data, uh, you suddenly find that those words fall out. And not just those words, but you'll notice back here, there are these other words like seems, um, both, life, has, my. Um, so there were a few other words, will, that, that weren't um, actually sort of relevant, obviously, to sentiment. And it's interesting to see every single one of them disappears from uh, uh, the data set or disappears from the set of, you know, so-called important features. So I think it's, uh, it, it's here where, um, I guess the, the main thing that I want to communicate uh, here is that we're not even um, able to formally express the assumption, but the fact that we maybe have the experience working with structural assumptions and thinking about questions of identifiability, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, even in places where you can't necessarily do uh, apply, you know, the fully coherent like mathematics of causal identification. I think there are still cases where you can apply causal thinking um, to to do something that you know design procedures to ins you know inspire uh, research that you know at least borrows the qualitative ideas, if not you know all the mechanics. So. Um, an interesting thing happens quantitatively if you train on the original data and evaluate on the revised data, then your model goes from really good to really bad. If you train on the revised data and evaluate on the original data, uh, your model goes from really good on the revised data to really bad on the original data. If you train on both of them together, the model actually does really good on both of them. So at least in this case, what it's saying is like, um, you, get, you can get, you know, it does slightly worse than the model that's specialized to either. And that makes sense because it's not, you know, you're, you're not relying on, um, you, you don't have, um, how should I put it? You know, there is predictive value. There actually is predictive value in these sort of uh, spuriously associated features, right? They are predictive, they are associated. Um, and so any sort of, you know, optimal estimation procedure is going to use them. Um, However, uh, the point is that while you pay a tiny cost for making a model that's sort of insensitive to those, you know, 
it's actually, you know, it, it, that cost is tiny, like it is small. Um, your model, you know, in this case, rather than getting 87% um, and 88%, we get uh, 84 and, uh, or in this case, we do better on, on one of those data sets. It goes back and forth um, depending on the, but you know, the point is like, you maybe pay a couple points accuracy on one of the data sets, but you get a model uh, from, the, from the combined classifier. Um, well, I know it's okay, it's the same pattern, just the, the, the lines are slightly flipped. Um, but anyway, so, so, so that's the key thing is that you're, you know, you were able to get a model that performs surprisingly well on both with almost, you know, only, only a, a tiny cost, you know, maybe a, a one to three points in, you know, accuracy. Um, so at, at a high level, you know, that the main thing, you know, to communicate that, right, is, is we are always faced with distribution shift that where there's a tendency of us now to sort of just sort of, uh, uh, that I think it comes from uh, a pattern of research that works in supervised learning but doesn't really work in general for all classes of problems, which is uh, just try stuff and see what happens on the benchmark. This doesn't work on a task that fundamentally is without a benchmark. Um, and that the only way we can sort of do things that make sense is by incorporating some kind of structural knowledge. The only way we can deal with game theoretic type situations, with causal inference type settings, um, with domain adaptations type settings. And um, one frontier, I guess, that I would, you know, kind of end here that I'm excited about is both how do we develop that sort of fundamental theory of um, leveraging, uh, you know, formal structural assumptions, but also how do we maybe use that work to inspire sort of maybe a more creative line of research that at least incorporates the thinking into all kinds of other areas, including human in the loop learning.